All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 142 today, The Alchemical Mind with Martin Ferretti. Uh, Martin's a good friend of the show, and he's helped me out with some things in the past, and uh, we've been trying to get him on here. He's been busy kind of cultivating his own thing, which is this new podcast, uh, but um, we're happy to have him on, so go check out his uh, podcast link down below the video. Uh, it's on iTunes, and um, check out our stuff. Uh, subscribe to our channel, mindescapepodcast.com, and uh, we're on Patreon as well at patreon.com slash mindescapepodcast. One big thing before we get going here, uh, we just unveiled the initial step of the app that we've been working on, which is called Indra's Web, um, and we'll do a whole episode about that in the future, what it means, what we're trying to do, and everything like that, but you can go and sign up so that uh, you'll get an alert once it goes live and then you can jump right in and all the stuff we talk about on the show ancient civilizations and psychedelics and spirituality and ufos and all those fringe and alternative topics will all be the main focus on there and um, the goal is to have rational discourse on those uh, topics and not let the uh, idiocracy of normal social media kind of pollute those waters so hopefully we'll, we'll get there but uh but without further ado, welcome on, Martin. It's a pleasure to be on your show, man. I had you on. I didn't have Maurice on, but I'm glad to uh, finally get to talk to Maurice. And and the website's great, by the way. I've been checking it out, so I've been enjoying that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you're going to be helping out with some stuff with that going forward, too. And uh, it's exciting. I think um, something new and... Uh, even if it's just to pop on here and there and jump into a debate mm -hmm. or something like that. So, you know, you know, there's no way to filter out all the idiots, you know, but hopefully, um, you know, there'll be something on there. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I love to get on Reddit. I know you get on Reddit sometimes. Uh -oh. I, see, I see you <laughs> posting links. I don't, uh, I don't actively, uh, post a lot on Reddit because of the same reason, you know, I think, sometimes it just becomes kind of an echo chamber mm -hmm. and, and people just want to believe what they want to believe. And, uh, and you get a lot of garbage on Reddit and, you know, I, I like to get on to kind of get a feel for what people are thinking in mm -hmm. terms of some of this crazy stuff that goes on, because I think there is some like a little truth behind every conspiracy. You know what I mean? And some of these ideas have to stem from somewhere. Right. I'm not saying like, you know, pedophile rings are real or they're not real or, you know, Freemasons control the world, don't control the world. I, I don't know. And I really don't care. Um, you know, my thing is always to kind of see what I feel is real to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the personal experience, I think, is more, more important. And, and, you know, you and I talked a little bit a while ago about this, uh, about Indra's Web and, and kind of the need for some scientific basis for some of this stuff. And uh, and you you don't get any of that I think in in some of these forums and I'm gonna call one out if if that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I love I love to go on our conspiracy for example, because the the amount of of garbage and vitriol that you get on our conspiracy is just insane, and and you even see from from regular folks that used to post on there like can we just quit talking about coronavirus or you know this that or the other Hillary Clinton like can we get to real conspiracies again? So it seems like even within well, circles of people... Let me stop you right there, you though. So then wouldn't it be, though, then conspiracy... Hypo if you're going to take it seriously, then you should say conspiracy hypothesis because a theory would indicate that it's been tested and proven and other people can replicate that. So that's... that. It's the terminology and... I don't know. You know how I feel. You listen to the show. I, yeah. I don't give any conspiracy any sort of credit or... Um, not because I, it's just, it's just a waste of my time. I would la rather look into things that can be verified or tested or if, you know, if it's meditation, let me go into that world and experience that. If it's psychedelics, let me take a psychedelic and experience that. If it's this, you know, like that's how I look at things. I'm not trying to just, I think a lot of this, that stuff, the conspiracy stuff is just purely speculative. And even if there's one or two parts that may fit into place or whatever, that still, how are you going to figure it out? It, it's, it's just one of those things where I think it's actually more times than not just ignorance or like, um, you know, um, the people at the top are just more ignorant of situations or don't care. 
than being actually malevolent and intentionally trying to hurt. Well, sometimes it's confirmation bias too, right? You you so fervently want to believe something to be true that you find any way to make everybody's viewpoint kind of fit into yours. Mm -hmm. And so you come up with crazy theories to try to make sense of your reality, whatever that is. And, and I'm not saying, like, I don't have crazy beliefs, right? I just uh, I just put out this episode on my solo meditation retreat, which, like, I, I listen back to it. As I'm, I'm, as I'm recording it, I'm like, this is just crazy. <laughs> I, I, I listen back to it, and I'm like, no one's going to believe a word that I'm saying. <laughs> and then uh, on Thursday, I'm putting out uh, the trip report. So I had this, uh, this major experience about a year and a half ago that I've talked about a bunch of times. But I've never gone into detail about what the actual experience was, uh, partially because I've been kind of afraid to talk about it publicly. And uh, but, you know, I, I, I came to a place after my solo meditation retreat where I was like, you know, regardless of how crazy this is, I don't care if anyone believes me like this is this is reality to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and I know that you and I have talked a little bit before about you know, what a psychedelic experience really is. Like, is it something in your mind? Are you actually traveling somewhere? Like, what's going on? And and I don't have an answer to that question, but I know that it was very real for me when I was going through the experience. Mm. You know what I mean? And and that's the same for this solo meditation retreat. I uh, I was talking to Sandy a little bit. I know Sandy listens to the show. Yeah, shout out to Sandy. And, uh, yeah, shout out to Sandy. She's She's fantastic. And and one thing that she said to me is because, you know, one, one of the takeaways that I had is, you know, I've been I've been reading books and meditating for you know, 20 years now. And and you, you get like little gleams of things here and there and you start to form some ideology, some philosophy for yourself. But just the the experience of being alone in the woods doing nothing but staring basically for three days just put me in this weird like focus place where everything just kind of clicked together. And, and I felt like I've wasted 20 years of my life doing reading and research. And all it took for me was to go to the woods and do nothing for three days. Right. It seemed yeah. totally counterintuitive. Right. But her, but her thing was if I hadn't done the work for 20 years, I wouldn't be in a place where those realizations would make any sense to me. Right. It's yeah, like, sure. uh, you know, when you, I, I know I just tweeted about Osho yesterday and, and you chimed in a little bit, you you have a lot of folks that go and, and do psychedelics and, and see things or they have visions of like Christ or the Virgin Mary or any, anything like that. And uh, and all of a sudden you feel like you're a prophet or you're God or anything like that. And and I feel like sometimes that's because maybe you you haven't put in the right amount of work. Or, or done the right work, whatever work that might be for you, where you don't have like a true understanding of your experience. You just have a very like fundamental materialistic point of uh, viewpoint of, of what happened to you. And, and so you get stuck in that place. Mm -hmm. And, and oftentimes people that have these experiences, I think just get stuck in, in the place where they may talk about, you know, the world is an illusion, but let me go give me some money so I can buy a Bentley. Yeah, I mean, I think that the psychedelic community, while I love there's a lot of cool people and interesting people, I do think there's a lot of idiots on there, too. And, and um, people that you would expect. And, and I guess I, I always assume that because I've had these experiences with psychedelics, it's made me a more introspective, understanding, empathetic, um, you know, spiritual person that that would carry over to you know other people but that's not the case there's a lot of people that look at it from um a, a completely different lens and i think that that's an interesting thing to take from that but at the same time i do think um I do think there's a lot of people that speak from authority. You know, if you're talking, there's a lot of people that like to debate that speak like, oh, I had this experience or, oh, this doctor did this experiment and did this. And I think while those are interesting, I like reading all the science. I like listening to all the anecdotes. It is just that it's an anecdote. It's it's happening with right. two your you know, you can't you, you 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 could share a psychedelic experience like we could all sit in a group and 
do a sacred mushroom ritual or something like that. That's mm. probably the closest you'll get to connecting with people in that realm. But in terms of... Um, in general, connecting with people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in terms of understanding, like you said, you, your experience was this, and then I have to then take you at your word for it because I, there's right. no way for me to even verify that. So I do think that there's this weird thing that happens on psychedelic forums and people going back and forth that they they think they have the answer just because they experienced it different or just because they have a different take on it or their interpretation of these archetypes or things that other people experience is, you know, so that's my only problem with that is there's a lot of people yeah. pretending out there like they've got the, all the answers. Yeah, but well, that might be the that might be the case cuz like everybody's own experience is their own, so they might have it figured out for them, but right. to, for them to, you know, have that affect you, like you have to be ready for, like you were saying, you have to be ready for your own experience. If you didn't prepare for those 20 years of research and stuff when you had that experience, it might have just went over your head. So, you got to kind of be ready for these things in your own life mm -hmm. for them yeah. to, you know, take take full effect. And I think it'd be so difficult to, like, really, truly replicate any of these experiences, right? Because the only way for do it, I mean, quite honestly, would never be done ethically, is to have, you know, like, a bunch of kids and you give them whatever, five grams of mushrooms and, and have them tell you what the experience is. Because what I see oftentimes, and, and this is not just psychedelics, this is any kind of mystical experience, is... You know, you hear a lot about like Terence McKenna, right, and machine elves and this, that, and the other. And so you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna smoke DMT or I'm gonna do mushrooms or whatever, and like I expect this particular thing to happen. And and I think going into that experience, part of your intention just automatically generates that imagery in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that machine elves don't exist or, you know, whatever other creatures you might see in us in an experience. I'm not saying they don't exist, but the thing is, how much of that is things that you heard on Reddit or a podcast or YouTube or from a friend or whatever else? And, and how much is it like a true experience that you form completely on your own, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, you know, when, when I started getting into psychedelic work, um, I, I wasn't on, you know, our psychonaut or checking out Arrowhead uh, next trip reports or anything like that. I just went in just to see what was going on. Right. And, uh, and I had certain experiences that I felt were real to me. And, and some of the experiences maybe jive with some things that you hear elsewhere, but I would say for the majority of my experiences, they don't jive with things that I've heard anywhere else. So does that make it a, a more true experiment? I mean, I don't know. It's it, like I said, it's true to me. Right. And I think right. ultimately that's that's the problem with with a lot of this stuff is. You can't prove anything outside of yourself to begin with. Right. So if something ends up being real to you, then it's just in your reality, it's real. Right. There's a, you know, you can, you can look at all kinds of philosophies about how like consciousness interacts with each other and whatever else, but you can't prove any of it. You can come to a general consensus of it. And, and that might be hard when you're a little more scientifically minded, a little more logically minded, uh, mm -hmm. but you can't prove anything 100%, right? E even like legit scientific experiments, oftentimes when they try to be replicated, you don't end up getting the same results. Um, I was listening to what podcast was it? Mysterious Universe just did a really good episode about this, I think last week, and uh, they were talking a little bit about the science, and it was based on some book that just recently came out. Uh, one of the examples was I don't remember the there was a, research, a psychological researcher, maybe ten years ago, uh, and it wasn't psychology, it was uh, biology, and he had done some experiments with uh, like transplanting tissues from like a white mouse to a black mouse and he was about to get some big award he was through this conference and he had realized like months before that his research didn't have the correct conclusions that he thought he had but he continued the experiments because he was getting funded and when he got to this point of like i need to present this research his research assistants were like this, this mouse smells like a black sharpie and like started wiping the mouse and then like the black just starts coming off the mouse. So the, the assistant realized like this whole thing's been BS the entire time. 
And so he was coloring the mouse to to keep the evidence to be what he thought it to be. Supporting initially. his own, yeah. yeah. To, to support what, what the initial theory was, yeah. And uh, I think the guy went to jail, actually. A, whole, a bunch of his papers were redacted. <laughs> Uh, I mean, he he had presented like dozens of papers, not just on this particular experiment, but all, all kinds of things. And so it led to this whole movement of like, well, now we need to go back and check these experiments and see how many of them are replicable. Mm-hmm. And and, you know, there's there's some scientific journals that have a strict policy of we're not going to review a paper if it's basically replicating a previous experiment. And and of course, that leads to some issues because, you know, it's supposed to be replicable, right? That's the point of science. You create an experiment, you come to a conclusion, right. and somebody else has to be able to prove it correct. Um, but some of these papers, some of these places, it seems kind of on purpose, maybe hide some of these additional studies because maybe the original conclusion wasn't 100% correct. Uh, and there's there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on in, in science, apparently. Um, I think uh, I think the stat that they gave was something like, you know, 30% of experiments can't really be replicated. Uh, so that kind of, that causes a problem, right? Mm-hmm. And and to go back to the conspiracy thing, this is why sometimes you get conspiracy theories that pop up, is because maybe when, when people try to do some of this research, you don't get 100% of the truth, right? Uh, maybe they try to pad some of the results in certain ways, uh, for whatever reason, usually funding. Uh, and I'm not saying that's true of all scientists, definitely right. not. But there is that group that that is true for. Yeah, I mean, I mean, th- through doing this podcast um, and doing all the research and looking into things deeper and reading things, so things that I thought that might have some truth to them early on have no truth at all. Um, mm-hmm. So I do uh-huh. think, though, by educating yourself and understanding how the mind works and then going back and understanding how the mind's evolved – from the beginning of civilization to where we are now, I do think you get a better understanding of what is a, is potentially or potentially true and what's completely BS or mostly BS or whatever. So my whole point with all that too was it's just a waste of time to me because I can look into things <laughs> that can be proven or at least experienced as opposed yeah. to thinking about something that actually has no bearing on my life. And even if it were true, uh, what does that mean? I don't know. You know, there's a whole lot of ways you can look at that kind of stuff. And I'm not, look, there's other podcasts that, that talk about that kind of stuff. You can talk about whatever you want. Um, and mm-hmm. I, and, and I feel like, um, there's people that do it justice, you know, but at the same time, it's just not something that's ever really interested me to really entertain. I mean, you know, there's ones that have been proven true, like the golf Atanka and stuff like that. So there are things that, yeah, you could point to and say, Oh, well look at this. But then, it's it's probably like the UFO thing where like 98% or 99% or whatever the percentages of, of most of it is, you know, BS, but then that small percentage, well, what's yeah. going on here, you know? And I think that uh, when... There's pe- always that little tidbit of truth. Yeah, and right now we have extra uh-huh. time right. and space to think, right? So I think there's a lot of people that are taking some of these things just even, even in a further direction than they need to go when you could... If we spent that energy looking into things that we can prove or real fringe things that may put might push us along as uh um uh you know human race or something like that i I, that's where my thought lies with that but sure uh, well and you know part of the problem is that i don't think we're we're raised to have any like genuine critical thinking skills and i don't know if you guys have kids or not i've I've been to many a parent teacher conference because my daughter is is very very add and uh you know, she she has gotten in trouble a lot of times for speaking out or not being able to control herself or doing things a particular way. And and the answer I've always gotten from teachers is, well, number one, she needs to go on medication, which I don't necessarily agree with. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure you guys can agree. And 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 the number two is, you know, we don't we don't have her here for her to learn this skill. She's here to learn how to like be a human being, basically. Right. We're like learn to listen and learn to cooperate with other students and things like that. And, and I totally get that because those are like genuinely important skills. You know, we live in a society. You right. can't just do whatever you want. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do feel like the critical thinking and, and thinking outside of the box is important because that's really the only way 
for for society to move forward right if everyone just thought the same thing all the time we just continue doing the same thing forever and ever right and there would never be yeah, any we've kind talked of about that a lot yeah yeah you gotta you gotta have someone that's a that's a free thinker that's gonna push the boundaries because that's I mean, I, me and Michael are musicians at heart, so we always bring up the, the music. Like, if Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or any of those bands didn't take what, what was already there and then push mm-hmm. it to a whole other level, who knows? Or like, Jimi Hendrix is a perfect example. I mean, this guy was doing stuff that was just shocking, but right. that's the stuff that lasts the test. That, that you know, that's what tests the time. And, uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Shout out to yeah. uh, Sean Cahill. He just commented uh, oh, two of my best. favorite people chatting, so I thought I'd uh, <laughs> say namaste. So <laughs> Sean's awesome. What's yeah, up, that was Sean? a good episode. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the love. Um, so I do think that um, – I do think, yeah, I mean, it's worth acknowledging that, you know, the w- world is a weird place and sometimes weird, unexplainable things – happen and then um sometimes there is some sort of mechanism behind the scenes that is you know pulling the strings but would you rather spend your time focused on that or you know because that that leads down a dark rabbit hole that doesn't lead to positivity and love and enlightenment usually the people that are talking about those things um and, and i'm not you know they have some issues whether it be mental whether it be you know just not being able to put one, one and two and three together or, um, <laughs> uh, and, and just, it, but it, at the same time, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's one of those weird things where I think you can talk about it in an intelligent way, but it's one of those things where when you see the general population of people that believe that kind of stuff, it's, it, there's nothing positive to say. Usually they're just negatively commenting on other things. Not only that, but they're doing what you said, is being like an you know an evangelist about it and getting out there and telling people they should believe this because this is why and I've got all the answers. Right. So that's a problem. It's a problem with religion. It's a problem with conspiracies. It's a problem with anything. When you get too evangelical about something, you can really, you know, do some damage out there. Well, and you know, so so we just had the uh, the New York Times article that came out, and I know you and I briefly talked a little about it. But, uh, man, UFO Twitter got so interesting, right? Because the day the article came out, everyone was like, see, like, here's the proof, right? right. UFOs are here. And then yep. the next day, right, I started hearing it from the people that were super gun ho the previous. Oh, yeah, but, like, they got the quotes wrong and, like, this was wrong. And, you know, why did they hold back this information? Or, you know, we expected this, but we got this. Like, where's the real disclosure? And, like, which one is it, right? Like, are you happy that we're getting some conversation coming out of it or are you just pissed off because it wasn't what you wanted? Right? Like you don't, mm-hmm. you didn't see little green men show up on TV and so now you're upset. I mean, there's gotta be a way for you to kind of balance these two things out. Right. And, and I think, I think the article was important, right? I, I mean, I told you I would have expected more out of it, but I, I do wonder if some of that is because the expectation from the community was that there was going to be more than it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think when you when you look at it in a particular way, I mean, it was plenty, right? The things that were said in the article say certain things about the world that most people don't think about. Right. And and maybe there's there will be some change with more normal people, I guess, uh, where they start to see these things. It's not like it's the first time we've had an article, right? There was one in 2017. Right. There was one in what like 2013, and and here we are, like still having these kind of articles popping up. But the conversation remains the same and it always remains within the same community. Right? right. And and you know, say what you will about TTSA and any of those guys, I don't care about the conspiracy theories there, but at least like there's conversation. Right. And mm-hmm. and the problem is a lot of times because there's no critical thinking, there's no conversation. Because it ends up just being two people yelling at each other because they can't agree on anything. I mean, I have a different take. I wa- I don't I love UFO Twitter, like watching what people comment and post and obviously we'll throw our episodes in there and talk about stuff when it's relevant or whatever. But, um, it's interesting to see though, that some people, some of these people really do have this thing monetized and down to a science. And I can almost predict what they're going to say about evidence that comes out. Um, and it's become so predictable that I, I don't really think that people 
that think that they're freely thinking on this are actually freely thinking about it. I, I do think that they get trapped. They get sucked into, you know, the Twitter comments or the Twitter wars or the, uh, the different things. And then people block each other and then they unblock each other. And then, you know, it's this whole roundabout thing. Uh, but I just, I, I think that when you have these conversations, you have to go in with an open mind. And if you, think that you have it all figured out or you know somebody else is false even though you don't have proof that they're false or whatever the case may be you just have to be you know weary of that like you can't read people's minds but at the same time i do think there's agendas behind most of the what some of these people are are saying there are people that are trying to get the truth out there or honestly looking for truth but right then, then you have people right. that have uh whole websites and you know making thousands of dollars on patreon and stuff like that you just have to be careful you have to you know nobody has all the answers so that's part of it uh, depends who you ask some people feel like they do have the answers that's the problem yeah. right yeah well and you know like it's tough right it's just human psychology you want the dopamine hit and you're making money doing this kind of stuff and and you know that you have a certain group of people that will just naturally gravitate to what you're saying because they feel that that's true and so again confirmation bias and and you know some of these people kind of prey on 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 those folks, and uh, and it's it's kind of sad. I, mean, I I got a DM actually on Reddit, oddly enough, um, about this kind of thing because somebody was I don't know somebody was asking me about uh, like red mercury. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with with red mercury. No. Uh, I mean like there's conspiracy stuff about red mercury, but it's also like an alchemical substance, right? And and in the conspiracy aspect, it's one of these things where like you can create some kind of centrifuge with this red mercury and that's how you create anti-gravity um mm. so they were asking about that because there's a website that sells red mercury right they were interested in it because of the alchemy aspects uh but there's a place that sells it it's like a four ounce vial for four three hundred dollars i think it was and you know my initial thing is like don't fall for snake oil right like that's mm -hmm. that's the problem all the time right i'm not saying some of these things don't exist they're not real right like, i'm not saying there's no aliens or crypto terrestrials ultra terrestrials whatever i'm not saying any of that but you you need to be able to understand that you know you call a snake a snake when it's a snake right so right why would somebody sell you a a vial of this stuff that uh you know can transmutate lead into gold or or create an anti-gravity device just like on the internet a little vial for 300 dollars, right um you need to think about these things. There, there has to be some other logic, right? And if they have the substance, don't you think that they would do something with it to kind of better themselves, right? Like maybe they would just transmute three tons of, of lead into gold and sell the gold. Why sell this little vial of mercury, right? right. Um, but, I mean, with but all that stuff, I'm far more likely to believe like the allegorical which would be like you know we've had yeah. pd newman on here which is that the philosopher's stone something along the the you know he's the red stone and like all like something being connected to like dmt and the dmt experience because mm -hmm. there you do have something where you're transmuting some real aspect into some sort of metaphysical aspect you know you're you're mm -hmm. you're changing um your whole mindset with that so i don't know i think that uh I think I, I understand your point about the snake oil. I mean, it's just it just comes down to again educating yourself. And through this mm -hmm. podcast, we've been able to educate ourselves and take some avenues that I think have some legitimacy behind some of these fringe topics. But I also think that there is a lot of BS too. And I think there's people that believe that they have the truth or part of the truth that are so blinded by everything. It's the same thing with the yeah, academic, you know, they write a book and then they defend the book and it's Clovis first and it's always Clovis first. Oh wait, now we have evidence, you know, 30,000 years ago, yeah, you know, is, is when they're finding evidence. So it's that whole thing where it happens in every facet of life. It's not just science. Mm -hmm. It's not just fringe. It's all of them. And you just have to be understanding of that and be wary of that and then go from there. Well, you know, yeah, and the Buddha, the, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's the same thing we always say. It's like 100 years ago, science was one thing. Yeah. We have science today. In 100 years, we're going to look back and go, these guys are, are fools. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the Buddhists say the only constant in life is change, right? 
And like that's the most that's the truest thing you will ever hear in your life, because nothing ever remains the same. Right. Like I think the problem is we just don't have a large enough vision, a, a large enough perspective on the universe to understand any of it. Right. If you know you live 70, 80 years, how are you going to be able to understand the process that takes 14 billion years or, or more? Right. Right. You only have a little slice of it. And, you know, <laughs> it's it's I, I, Laplace's I, billiard shot is what it is. If you right. were given all the calculations, the geometry, the physics, the quantum, if you were given everything, all the ways to calculate it, you could determine what I was going to do next, what you were going to do next, what everybody was going to do next. We don't have, like you're saying, that perspective or those tools. So there's really no way to figure out if we do live in a completely deterministic universe mm -hmm. or is there free will or is there life after death or you know all these different topics and i do wonder like what what kind of answer is expected of some of these things right mm -hmm. so if you if you do like quantum physics right and you want to know how particles are formed or you want to learn like how the universe was created like what answer will suffice for you like, will there be a point where you'd be like, OK, this is the answer. Like, we can stop here now. And I, I would say you would never get to that point because you're always going to find something else that you want to find the answer for. So if we ever find out what happened, like how the Big Bang happened, right, if the Bing Bang were true. Well, now we're going to want to know what happened before. Right. So then mm -hmm. we're going to spend thousands of years experimenting to find out what happened before. And then maybe we'll find the answer to that. And then we'll be like, OK, well that had to come from somewhere right so let's find where that goes and just it's an infinite recursion and and it never stops and i'm not saying like don't try to gain knowledge and understanding of, of how the world works i think there's a lot of stuff that's important to know but i think at some point you just have to kind of find what the basis is for you mm -hmm. and and kind of go from there right um i don't know if it's in the episode that just came out or the one that's coming out uh, in a few days, but I was telling the story of the, uh, the the Earth sitting on the elephants. Are you familiar with the story? That and the turtle one. I'm both of them. I've, I've yeah. Heard. So it's a, it's a, yeah. That's the same story. So if someone's like, well, is the Earth floating in space? They're like, well, no, the Earth's not floating in space, right? It's sitting on these four elephants, right? And and that works fine for forever. And then one day someone's like, well, that's stupid for the Earth to just sit on elephants. What do the elephants sit on? Right. And so someone's like, oh, well, they sit on a turtle. Right. And then that works fine for a long time. And someone's like, well, what does the turtle sit on? And then someone's like, OK, well, it sits on another turtle. And then it's just turtles all the way down. Right. Because there's always going to be another turtle for the turtle to sit on. Um, so, you know, there has to be at some point some basis, some basic grasp of what any of this is. And. And I don't think as people we're ever really going to be happy with any of that foundation. We're always going to try to find more because that's just kind of how we work, right? People are explorers. Uh, I think that's why so many people have mental issues and you know, just don't know what to do with their lives because this, the reality that we've created in, in modern society is just so counter to our basic instincts, right? And, and some of those instincts might not be good, um, and so we try to change them and, and obviously morality changes all the time as well, but, but there has to be a way for us to find some kind of balance between like, we know all the stuff and we're okay with not knowing all of it. Yeah. Right? I think so that's you, a good point. Go I think we're, uh, I think we're natural explorers, like you were saying. And when for me personally, the last couple of weeks, I'm a, I'm a photographer, so I've been going on little walks or adventures and it's, I've never been happier, but at the same time, when these people don't get into these adventures, that's when I think their mind starts to create their own adventure. And maybe that's where we start seeing some of these conspiracy theorists or people calculating some stuff that may or may not be backed by any information. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think that uh, we could beat this thing to death, but let's move on because I, I think that there's, oh, a, we far, will. there's we a far will. more interesting <laughs> conversation to be had. So I, I do want to get into some... Uh, I know you're really into alchemy and everything. Um, so what aspect of alchemy, because there's some people that 
practice physical alchemy and then there's other people that practice spiritual alchemy and um you know we've had you know alex talking about that on here before we've also had uh lee talking about this kind of stuff before so what aspect of um alchemy interests you and how did you get into it and is there any thing that you've really taken away from it so far hmm um so that that's an interesting question because within alchemy you always have the two camps you have the the physical camp and you have the spiritual camp and and i think there's there's good in both of these camps right if we didn't have alchemy we wouldn't have had guys like newton and and the enlightenment show up and all the scientific knowledge that we've gained right all that stems from their interest in alchemy mm -hmm. and and transmuting lead into gold or any other substances I think for me, that's kind of the same as when I when I talk about religion and mysticism, where religion is very grounded in certain rules that need to be followed, and mysticism are more of a personal experience of what the universe is like. So for me, alchemy is more of a spiritual, mental practice than it is mixing chemicals together or, you know, undergoing the alchemical process. Um, I, I think for me, it's kind of like a symbolic language. And, you know, I haven't talked about mystery schools yet on the podcast, but, but I want to. Um, and, and to set up the basis for that, I'm going to be doing two episodes on the Hermetica next week. And, and that's kind of what began to get me interested into alchemy. Um, but uh, but I want to set up some basis for that before, because I think it, there's things that happen in the world and, and certain knowledge that is gained that most people just don't understand. Right. And, and the simplest metaphor for this is like the movie The Matrix. Right. Um, you take the red pill, the blue pill. Right. Mm -hmm. And most people can't be woken up a certain period of time, whatever. Uh, I think that is true in some respects in in just the way the world works and there's certain things that just people can't understand without doing the work first and so those things have to be hidden in symbols and metaphors and mythology and folklore and all these other stories and you whether you're the person that understands or does not understand you're still going to gain some knowledge of the story right uh I always like to use SpongeBob for like normal people because that's that's a good show uh, as an example. My kids loved SpongeBob when I was old, uh, when I was uh, going on, and and I watched it with them. My kids love SpongeBob for a particular reason, right? The character's stupid, like Patrick's kind of uh -huh. stupid. They have a good time together, they're friends, they go on these adventures. Mm -hmm. But I like SpongeBob because there's certain jokes that are very adult jokes that my kids would not understand. But right, the right. writers are smart enough to write them in a certain way where, like, here's a little bit for you parents. We know you're watching, right? right? Um, and so I feel the same for a lot of these mystery tra traditions, uh, including some of this alchemy stuff, is that you, you can't just tell people this is the way the world works because then you just establish a religion, right? You have to present these things in symbols and have them figure it out for themselves, right? Because part of attaining that that knowledge, getting that answer is doing the work, right? And this goes mm -hmm. back a little bit to what I was talking about before with this solo meditation retreat that I went in. Um, if you don't do the work, you're going to get something out of it, right? You're going to get uh, laws and, and moral judgments that you can make and, you know, Ten Commandments, all this kind of stuff. But if you really dive into it and you are able to kind of break apart what the symbols mean, you're going to get a completely different meaning out of it, right? A, a second layer beyond that. And to me, that's what alchemy is. I think alchemy is purely spiritual and mental. Uh, you know, kind of like you know, people talk about Buddhism as a religion or a philosophy. Like to me, Buddhism is a science, right? Like it's like the first psychology uh, to me because a lot of things still ring true to people. Right. You, you get a different perspective because it's not a Western perspective, but the way that the Buddhists break down the the states of mind are very much based in reality. But oftentimes they're veiled in these things of, well, maybe enlightenment or, you know, demons or this, that or the other different aspects of heaven. 
Um, but I think those things just speak to a, a true current state of mind uh, mm -hmm. that you can attain and achieve. And, and alchemy is the same. You can turn lead into gold. Um, you can turn your stupid mind into this place, like this, this gold mine of ideas. Well, actually, and actually, to that point, though, they've been able to turn gold uh, or things into gold like lead um, mm -hmm. in, in the real world now. It's just it's such a tiny amount. I don't know the pro sure. you can look it up, but there has been a science scientific breakthrough where they're able to turn other things into gold now, uh, using some sort of process that uh, I don't know the whole all the details about, but that that is a possibility now. So, sure, and it might have been a possibility through some process at some point in the past. I'm not I'm not saying any of right, that. right, right. I because, just wanted you know, to point that out. The process is very complicated. Yeah, and I mean you can just you know shoot it with uh, neutrons or whatever, so you enlarge the nucleus and you add the electrons. I mean, that's really the only difference between any element, right? Right. It's just the number of protons which is electrons in it. So if you're able to add mass in, in some kind of way, then yeah, you could do it. Um, but again, I, I don't think that's what any of it really means, right? You can take it that way and spend lifetimes trying to do it that way. Um, but, you know, as far as we know, nobody actually managed to do this that underwent through these processes in like a scientific way. Right. But we gained a lot of knowledge out of it. Right. So maybe that's the gold. Right. That the process of experimenting on these objects and substances created knowledge. That could be the gold. That's fine. But it's not like a physical thing that you can hold on to. Right. Right. And that's the problem. Every time you want to see a result, you expect to have something that you can hold and completely understand and, and just use in the real world. And and I don't think that's necessarily it. A lot of times, I think oftentimes we fall into these traps of just like everything has to be purely physical and mm -hmm. and you kind of deny some of these other aspects and I'm not saying either way is right or wrong, right? Whatever works for you works for you. Right. Uh, but from from the experience that I've had, that's the the feeling that I get, right? Mm -hmm. Is I, I just can't abide by that. And and sometimes that leads me down some weird mental places, right? Because when you start having some of these realizations, you get like natural extensions of those things. We're like, if A is true, then B must be true and C must be true. Right. And C is like really counterintuitive, right? And goes against everything that I'm supposed to be doing right now. Um, but, you know, these are just the conclusions that you come up with. And your reality is really the only reality that exists, right? Yeah, I think I, the way I think about these things where I used to be more binary, um, about it now i see things in terms of well whether it's literal or non-literal or physical or non-physical uh, i think everything is kind of a little bit of um not both but like in the mid it's, it's in the middle for me in terms of the way i look at these things where i do see obviously the physical realm things associated with the physical realm and you know, things like that. I also look at the metaphysical concepts and can see a lot of points there. So I just try and blend the two together uh, to create this ultimate one version or world myself, you know, and I think that there's a lot of people that probably do that. Um, but when you look at kind of this idea of transmutation, I always think about who we are from more of a spiritual standpoint. So like the whole physical thing, yeah, alchemy was kind of like a precursor to chemistry in a lot of ways and um, people still practice it and I'm sure there's still some uh, people implementing it in a way that's pretty profound that we just don't understand mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that when I look at this this subject I look at it from like the spiritual standpoint in terms of this process that I've gone through whether through learning all these things and knowledge and um, ev I could learn everything in the world and I still don't think that I would have enough knowledge uh, that's just me personally. But that being mm -hmm. said, you mentioned something earlier. I've come to grips that I'm not going to know everything or I'm not going to get any of these answers. But for some reason, I feel like I'm supposed to try. Um, and I don't know what that is. Maybe it's my roots being raised, you know, religious, or maybe it's um, something that's been built into me over time. But I feel like it's my duty to kind of um, change myself in that way. 
Um, well, life's all about the path, so you're you're, yeah, you're I doing mean, it right, my man. I w- I would say that just being human, man. Like that that's just how people are. People are curious, mm-hmm. right? People always want. I mean, right now we can't because basically the the whole planet's colonized. Uh, you know, there are still wild places that you can go to. But, you know, how far away are you from another person or a town or a city, right? Probably not very far. Um, but, you know, for, for most of our history, it was just bands of people traveling around the world and finding new places and new animals and new substances and new rock formations and whatever. And and we just don't have that anymore, right? And And the way that we do that now is more true through introspective work because that's the only way we can explore, mm-hmm. right? And And I think... To me, at least partially, that explains sort of the the rise of psychedelic use, uh, because we just we don't don't have the answers in the the institutions that we've created, and so you think we that try the, to explore somewhere else. But do you think that that's because so you could go let's say three thousand two thousand BC somewhere around there, people mm-hmm. were meditating and doing mm-hmm. what you're talking about introspectively thinking, but do you think that that's because they were unable to get off this planet where we know. It's mm. possible to get off the planet while it's unlikely that we're going to get everybody off the planet anytime soon or find some better earth or whatever the case may be. We do have that perspective and knowledge that, oh, this is possible. There is more out there. Um, so I, to your point, though, mm. I think that that still rings true, the looking inwards, because that is the, the inner space world, um, I think, is far more fruitful to becoming a better person than somebody that's obsessed with getting off of this world. <laughs> but back then they didn't have that now. So back then that was really the only way to look at it. I think. I mean, you can get into some discussions about like ideas of afterlives and, and things like that with the point you just made. Um, again, I think that's kind of a, a corruption of the original idea, right? So the, the difference between religion and mysticism, because somebody might get into one of these trans states purely on meditation or through a psychedelic and and say okay like this is what's beyond right because they they don't they don't know what's going on right they just know maybe they smoked this plant or they meditated for you know 40 days and 40 nights and all of a sudden like here we are um and and they show show these experiences but not everybody can get to that place right you know i know you meditate mike i know maurice he just started meditating Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know how long you've been meditating, Mike, but I, you know, I've been meditating for almost 20 years, mm. right? And I, I, I've still, until last week, had a very tough time going more than a couple hours um, because it takes a lot of discipline to just sit still for that long, mm-hmm. right? A couple it, hours? It, I can barely do 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good, though. Most people can't <laughs> do 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, but think about, like, I know you love Plato's uh, the, the Allegory of the Cave. Think about actually going to a cave for 40 days and 40 nights, right? This is like stuff that happened with people back then. Well, I'd for sure sure try the experiment of naturally inducing DMT through darkness. I would try that if that was the case. If I really was going to do that, that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, How many people would want to do that, right? Like I just shared an experience that I had where I was in the woods for three days, right? I wasn't in a cave. I was just in the woods, but just sitting for three days. Most people wouldn't even want to do that, right? Just the three days. Imagine going in in pure darkness for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm -hmm. So out of that, you're just like, okay, well, that's a cool experience. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use that, right? I like that because I would love to go to this place. And, and that mystical experience becomes a religious ceremony. Um, I'm not saying that religion's bad, although there's certain things I don't like about institutionalized religion. Um, but I think oftentimes it's kind of a watering down of a very real experience that anybody could have if they put in the work. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, people don't want to put in the work, right? It's much easier to pop a vitamin than to eat your vegetables every day, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's look, it's not easy um taking personal responsibility for your being, right? I mean, mm-hmm. um trying to become a better person, trying to become uh a more intelligent, a kinder, nicer person. I think that those are hard things. It's not an easy, it's not default for us. Right. Uh, I think it's going against our nature to be honest with you, which we are animals. So whether we have some divine aspect or um 
you know, we're the sp- a spark of something greater or a fractal of something bigger. That I don't know, but I do know that we know for sure um, we've evolved. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. So if that's the case, then there is going to be this thing that's kind of holding you back, right? And it's our job to kind of um, change that or transmute that or whatever. So I think that uh, in the world, what we're seeing is just a lot of people kind of on default, which is just to survive. And by surviving, you're not really being your best self, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot to what you just said. I, uh, I, I've mentioned on my show a couple of times how how jealous I've been of my dogs at some points hmm. um, because, uh, you know, it's so inter- I, I especially my dog. So I have, I have two. Uh, the, the big ones are Great Pyrenees and uh, sweetest dog ever. But I, I found myself watching her because I, I've been really into mindfulness for, for many, many months now. And I, I do all kinds of mindfulness exercises. And one of the ones that I did was mindful observation of my dog because how interesting to just – for one, not have the the ability to convey certain thoughts, right? Like there's no way for me to know what my dog thinks, mm-hmm. right? I can assume if my dog sees me, she's happy because she wags her tail or, you know, she's hungry because she walks to her bowl, like these kind of symbolic uh, language that she can use. But I, for all I know, my dog could be having some kind of thought, right? But there's no way for me to know that because I don't speak dog, okay? The way we communicate is just kind of a basic understanding of body language. Mm-hmm. And... And what that must mean, because so much of our existence is purely indicated by language, right? And and I'm fascinated by language. I was an English major in high school, in, in college, and I've always been fascinated with that kind of stuff. And you know, I've played around with uh, conlang, so constructed languages, where you like create your language to express certain things. Um, there's there's a whole subfield of linguistics uh, people doing this, and. And what it must be like to not have that language, right? I mean, you can go any direction with this. Like the the one that I talked about uh, recently, and again, I don't know if the episode came out or not because I record ahead of time, is, uh, you know, having a language with no nouns, right? As a matter of fact, it might have been on the solo retreat episode mm-hmm. uh, where I talk about maybe part of the problem is that we see things as constantly affecting each other, right? The, the billiard ball example that you gave earlier. Uh, where you hit the billiard ball and it goes in a trajectory and it hits another one and that does something and the other one does something. Uh, what if none of these things are true, right? What if there's not objects impacting other objects? What if we start seeing things as verbs, right? So as as just events instead of objects. And, and how those things intertwine when you see them as events that just unfold and maybe at some point overlap because they continuously unfold. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's something that I got out of just watching my dog because my dog has no understanding of any of these things. And my dog is perfectly happy just laying down, waiting for a squirrel to climb a tree so she can go bark or waiting for me to feed her. Um, and, and yes, I think that's completely counterintuitive as a person. But, but I think a lot of these enlightenment states that people talk about are very reminiscent of going back to this place – of just pure being, right? Because the dog has no need for any of these things, right? As long as the dog is fed and got a chance to go out and pee, like the dog is perfectly fine. Right. And and we don't we don't have any of this stuff, right? We we have the constant need to communicate with each other, to express our feelings, to write them down, to go on social media, to I mean even just listen to podcasts, right? One thing that I thought about is like should I when I go on the solo retreat, do I bring music with me? Right. Because when I meditate, oftentimes I do like to have some kind of music or some tones going on in the background. Mm -hmm. And and I decided not to because I felt like if I wanted to be real minimalistic about it and real hardcore about it, even the act of listening to music was doing something. Right. And I mean, you can go really deep and say, well, just like sitting there staring is doing something. Maybe nature can Um, be your music, the birds chirping, the bugs, you know, all the stuff. Well, and you you realize a lot of things, right? You realize certain birds only come out at night. Some birds only come out during the day. So you 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 find what the different songs are. I don't know what birds uh, they are by me, but they're chirping at three thirty at night, <laughs> and it's pissing me off. I don't know. Uh, but but you don't normally realize these things. Right. You see what I mean? 
And so I want to just have just like a pure experience of consciousness because this was inspired by my dog. My dog just sits there and is perfectly happy just sitting there being a dog and right. doing nothing. Well, I, what you were saying is very, you know, that goes back a long ways too. I'm sure there's an Eastern philosophy um, um, point for that. But I know Parmenides uh, mm-hmm. had that idea where everything is one thing and it's in constant flux, you know, yeah. which is true to a certain extent, um, you know, but like I said, you know, I'm sure the Eastern tradition has many different versions. I don't know if it's, you know, Lao Tzu or who would have said something similar to that, but I mean, you can go to any school of any Eastern thought and there will be some truth in what you just said in any of them. Right. right? Um, you know, that's why you, you guys know, I love ancient Egypt. And one of the reasons I started listening to you guys is because of the, the ancient civilization stuff. But, uh, you know, everything always seems to stem back from Egypt, right? Uh, I was talking a little bit about the, uh, the Pythagoreans. Uh, matter of fact, I think that's on the, next, that's on the psychedelic trip episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was, I started talking about Pythagoras and, and some of the, uh, the alchemical knowledge in his work. When you think about Pythagoras, if you remember from school, you don't think about any of that stuff, right? Because you're not taught that stuff. Right. Uh, you just know, like, the Pythagorean theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals yeah, C squared. Yeah, if you didn't know, you would have thought he was just this Greek mathematician. But no, he started an ascetic ancient cult that believed in a lot of metaphysical things. And it was all veiled in mathematical symbi- symbology. And reincarnation, right? I think, was the main. Yeah. Yep. Um so I, I dive into that a little bit because just like the, the symbols they use for, for triangles are so esoteric, right? Like I, I hadn't even thought about it where, uh, where the shape of a triangle is actually the, the Holy Trinity. Mm-hmm. So it's Osiris, Isis, and, and Horus. And, and there's different levels to each of these aspects, uh, which is how the universe is created, right? So you have uh, like the, the alchemical symbol, like Mercury and salt is Osiris. You have, the, the four elements is Isis, and then Horus is the five stages of life. So minerals, plants, animals, humans, enlightened beings. Right. And and you can have all of creation stemming out of this. And it all comes from this Egyptian mythology. And so you know, everything always gets attributed to the to the Egyptians. But I do wonder, man, and I'm, I'm curious to know from you guys, it couldn't just have been that way. Well, all of a sudden, everything just happens in Egypt, Right. This, this seems like knowledge that we've acquired for forever, right? You look at how people study the stars and constellations and the amount of knowledge there. It's not something that can be acquired in, you know, a couple decades, a few hundred years. Mm-hmm. It, it has to come from observations over thousands of years, right? How would you know this 26,000-year rotation if you're not observing the stars for 26,000 years, right? Like, now maybe we could do it with computer simulations, but when you don't have that, how can you figure this stuff out? Right. You have to have the observation. Well, I mean, I would say point to the Egyptian Zeptepi, which there was some sort of precursor. I mean, yep. you look at even Gobekli Tepe, how did they know? That's even, what, 7,000 years before um, ancient Egypt. So uh, my thought would be that that, is, that was an ongoing thing, whether it was be- a little bit before Gobekli Tepe or j- just you know, after if, you know, there was the cataclysm that we think that there was during the younger Dryas, whether it be mm-hmm. the common impact hypothesis or whether it be uh, Dr. Shock's uh, solar induced um, dark age caused by some sort of uh, solar flare that created tons of electrical storms on Earth or whatever the case may mm-hmm. be. I do think um that there was this slowly evolving picture of that going through the years, uh, you know, like pre- even precursors to maybe Mason, uh, you know, the Masonic traditions and things like that. Um, now, was there one specific one? I don't know. I mean, is, was no. that your question? Was it, or is it just no, that? What I'm, do you think? Like you're saying that you don't think that it just the Egyptians figured it out and then it went from there. There's got to be some sort of like lead into that. You know. Graham Hancock loves to say the more we find things, the more we realize that things are older than they seem. Yeah. Whatever, something like that, right? Whatever Things it is. keep getting older. I things keep getting older, yeah. And, you know, I remember when I was going to school, and we're 
all roughly the same age, so maybe you guys heard something similar. Um, but you know, you always hear like civilization starts six thousand years ago in Sumeria, mm-hmm. like uh, anatomically modern humans maybe came around you know ten fifty thousand years ago, something like that. And and this is only, I mean, how old high school was what twenty something years ago, twenty years ago. Right. Um, think about how much that has changed in that that period of time. Oh right? yeah. I mean now. Anatomically modern humans are three hundred thousand years old, even older, right? Mm-hmm. Seven hundred and eighty thousand. You talk to Bruce; he talks a little <laughs> bit about this, yeah. right? Um, so, at least three hundred thousand years ago, and think about the amount of knowledge that we've gained just in the time that the three of us have been alive, and that's just like a tiny fragment of all of history. Right, less than a tenth of a tenth of one percent, mm-hmm. and we've gained all this knowledge. I, I find it very difficult to believe that it took us, you know, two hundred and ninety-five thousand years to to sketch a bird on a clay tablet. You see what I mean? Yeah. If and, and there's there's art in caves from hundreds of thousands of years ago, so we're obviously already doing art. Why would it take us? A hundred thousand years to say, oh, instead of drawing it on this wall, let me write it on this clay tablet or whatever on the ground I, I and think, make it mean this. Yeah, I think that's you just brought up the point, which is telos or meaning. You have to. There has to have been that connection made. I don't know when it was, but I mean, you make a good point that if we had the capabilities of making those things, how come we didn't make that leap then with the, um, you know, the the uh, Lasco cave art or whatever right. the, the, the case may be. Um, and I think that the, you just answered your own question, which was the, the meaning of it. I think that's the, the bridge. That's the bridge between the two. So at what point did humans come up with meaning or is there some sort of prevailing meaning in the universe that we just finally tapped into or became aware of? I think that that's the better question, in my opinion, when in regard to that. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, there's some interesting conjecture. Um, I think that one of the examples that was given was with the Odyssey, for example, uh, talking about consciousness and, and the the arrival of human consciousness, and how maybe this has been a very recent process, right? Like even though anatomically we may have been the same with the same brain mass for a hundred thousand years, let's say, um, it, it's not like we. I mean, you, you can get into the whole catastrophism thing if you want to hear uh but even though we had these things in place we didn't necessarily have the label of consciousness we have now and so when you when you read some of these mythologies of uh you know like evil god versus good god or things like that there or, or people seeing visions it's because we hadn't quite learned as animals what this new consciousness thing was Mm-hmm. And and we end up creating this mythology to explain it, uh, and that, you know now that we're modern and super awesome, uh, <laughs> all those things are ridiculous because you know we're not cave people. Uh, I mean, there's problems to that idea, of course, because it just Im- naturally implies that we're better now because we've been around more and we know more, right? Like we go pew pew and they threw rocks, right? Yeah. So. Uh, but to that point, though, that's what I was going to say is we're kind of egotistical now to think that yeah. um, within this short amount of time that we know better than some of these ancient civilizations or empires that lasted thousands of years. The U.S. has only been around a few hundred years, you know, like so I think while, yeah, we were advanced with technology, they might have been more advanced with concepts. I mean, even, you know, I'm not political. We don't talk about po- politics mm-hmm. on this podcast, but you look at the Republic by Plato and and some of the concepts in there and we could use a philosopher king <laughs> ruler right now you know so it's it just it's some of those things are i think um that's kind of like universal knowledge where maybe in a thousand years they'll come up with some better system where there isn't one person in charge but or a handful of people but there's something else that was implemented that we couldn't even see now so uh, i just think that when you look back, though, you ha- you can't look at it from the lens of how you look at things now because you will look at something that looks like it's flawed mm-hmm. or outdated. You have to kind of put yourself in their consciousness and look at what was known at the time and what people's uh, thoughts on, you know, T. 
teleology and epistemology and things like that. And then you'll get a better sense of where they were. But yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough game going back and forth like that too, because as much as we want to know that the secrets of ancient Egypt and the, the, the truth uh, of what they knew, we might not ever know in terms of what, how mm-hmm. they knew it. So it's, it's a, and we have to be all right with that. Yeah. Yeah. That, see, I like woke Maurice, man. He is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I want to beat you. the shit out of him. <laughs> no, don't do that. No, I, lo- I love, I love him. I love him, but I will beat him up in person. Yeah. It, it's uh no, it's actually been really cool to see the, the change in interaction between you two, because I, I started listening pretty early on to the podcast um, I think the first episode I listened to was when you guys crossed over with uh, the Stink Bros. Mm. Uh, oh, nice, nice, yeah. Yeah. So, and then I went back and listened to all the previous. I did the same thing with them because I found them through I don't know something, and I went back and listened to all the previous episodes. But uh, you know, going back and and hearing Maurice in those early episodes, and hear Maurice now is is really interesting. And I think I can definitely see uh, more engagement with Maurice in the conversation, which is really nice. Uh, Cause Maurice, you have some good things to say. I mean, I'm not saying Mike does it. Mike's a great host, but, uh, but it, it's cool to see kind of that change in, in the interaction between you two and, and with Maurice and interacting with the guests as well. Yeah. We actually kind of flip flopped our entire perspectives too. Cause Michael was super, <laughs> uh, esoteric in the beginning. Not that he isn't now, but he's way more, spe- you know, skeptical on just everything. More calculated and with it. Like I said, I think yeah. that that comes with, learning things though too because there's certain things that are just you know um whatever i don't i can't i don't i can't think of a good example right now but if i look at for instance okay we were talking about this on the last episode and we're talking about egypt now so it's relevant the temple of seti everybody thinks that there's spaceships and james bond vehicles and everything carved into the 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 thing into the temple of seti and that's not the case. What it is is they're older hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics, and then they carved newer hieroglyphics on top of that, right. giving it the illusion of that. Now, that's human pareidolia. Uh, initially, when we first started this podcast, I thought that that was actually a possibility. But knowing what I know now, it's hard for me to let and be like, no, I still believe it. You know, So that's how I carry that philosophy into most things, where if I learn something that contradicts something and it's just logic and reason, I, I can't. I can't go against that. Yeah. Well, I think also just being exposed to more ideas. Uh, and I think that's one thing I like about your show is whether you agree with the guest or not, you, you have the guest on and you're able to have a, a good conversation. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have people on that have some very outlandish ideas. And I think mm-hmm. I'm not saying that point of view is necessarily worse than any other. Um, but sometimes you can... I, I think regardless of how modern we are, we we're still very instinctually driven. And and I think, Mike, your instincts are very good sometimes in recognizing uh, BS, uh, going back to the snake oil thing, mm-hmm. uh, where you're like, I can appreciate that that's your reality, but that's kind of preposterous. Right. right. And I, I don't think it comes off that way when you have the guest on. Um, but well, I, I would think never do that unless I felt like it was going into debate mode and they wanted to go there sure i would yeah. never do that to anybody that we've had on the show but but i think that explains some of the changes right and then maurice being exposed to more of the stuff would naturally make him more curious right mm-hmm. so you know there may be a point where you guys switch back right maurice becomes <laughs> oh the, i'm sure we will flip one. flop again yeah. <laughs> well but the other thing though too was it I could never get Maurice in. I mean, we've always talked about this kind of stuff, you know, like aliens and panspermia and yeah. we get high and we're camping and we start <laughs> to speculate and philosophize and all that stuff. We've always done that. I mean, we're cousins. We've grown up together. Sure, we're yeah. the same age, yeah. went to the same schools, the whole thing. Um, so we've always been like best friends too. So there's that element of it. And I think what the podcast was actually lacking in my opinion was the rapport that we have with each other when we see each other in person. So when we Mm. naturally react to each other or have these kind of conversations or we laugh or we joke around, you know, you know, there's one element of it where it's like, yeah, you have PC culture and you don't want to say the wrong thing. So you do have to be somewhat calculated um, in what you're saying to not offend anybody. So we're very mindful of that. We don't want to ever want to offend anybody. We want to be very, um, 
you know, kind and nice the way that we consider ourselves as people too, you know, the way we carry ourselves. But at the same time, um, we've always been like comedy fans and you look at a lot of like the stand ups and all the comedy podcasts and that's kind of how we joke around with each other too. Now on the other end of things, I think that Maurice just wasn't as tuned into this um scenario that you would uh, um this not necessarily just the spirituality but just like all these esoteric topics it's not that he wasn't interested in it or learned a lot or anything but it's different than like if he hit since he had his spiritual awakening there's a different feeling to it because he actually cares and he's actually putting forth effort into it as opposed to before where it might have just been an interesting thing to occasionally comment on or have an opinion on now it's like that's part of who he is so therefore he has more to say and if that's the case the stuff that we're talking about will only get better from there yeah i uh i have this with my wife a lot and i I bring my wife up a lot on the podcast because you know we're like yin and yang right yeah um and and when when she and i met I, i don't think the the separation of of ideology was as as obvious as it is now and and obviously, like we still have a lot of shared interests and, and things like that. And uh, you know, if we were both the same people, it would be a boring marriage. Hmm. But but I've I've noticed this a lot with my wife and I over the past you know year and a half or two, uh, as I get deeper and deeper into this stuff because I've always been interested in, and I've always done the research and I've always done the meditation things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the the deeper down a rabbit hole you go. Uh, the more you realize there's a lot of rabbits down there, right? And so there's yeah. many burrows that you can dive into. And and so I go pretty deep into some of the stuff, but I, I don't share with my wife because my wife just thinks I'm crazy, right? Uh, I remember one time I, I started sharing a, a meditation experience that I had with her, and <laughs> she's like, don't bring Jesus into this. Hmm. I, I, obviously a joke, right? She knows Jesus has nothing to do with meditation, right? Uh, at, at least in that sense. But... Um, but she's just not interested in this kind of stuff. But but I do notice every once in a while some synchronicity or some overlap into things. Uh, you know, I I told her I was going to go on this meditation retreat, and she's like, "You mean on purpose? You're going to go into the woods uh, in the heat and sit in a tent for days?" I said, "Yeah." She's like, "All right," which of course my kids used to do with me. But now that they've gotten older, like if there's no cabin and internet, they're not going to the woods with me. Yeah, because right? didn't you try and go somewhere by your house? Like I listened to that episode. Didn't you try and go somewhere yeah. by your house, and then you realized that that wasn't going to happen? There's ants or fire ants everywhere. Yeah, there were fair. All right, so what happened was I usually there's a spot that I usually go to in a national forest, um, and I've had the spot for years, and nobody has ever touched the spot. So I'm assuming they don't want to find it. Um, Probably because usually when people go hiking, they don't go off trail. They stay on trail. Right. And so it's not very difficult to, to, to hide a good camping spot. Um, but so I was going to go there. But, you know, because of the whole pandemic stuff, I don't know if they've changed the rules about the overnight camping or anything like that. Uh, so I was like, I'm going to go next to my house because there's there's a giant field. I don't know how big it is, but it's it's humongous. Uh, maybe like 50 acres. I don't know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And there's a river that runs through it. And so I know that there's trails there because uh, I've taken my daughter to uh, my ex's friend's house and she lives near us. And she told me that about 30 years ago or so, all the kids in the neighborhoods used to hang out in those woods because they connected all the subdivisions. Um, So I was like, okay, I know there's trails back there. I'm going to go. And I go over there and I'm just trying to find a good spot to camp, right? Nice flat spot, no trees around. And I found several but every time I would get on one of these spots, I just like my my legs are crawling with ants, fire ants. And uh, so finally, I was like, I'm just I'm wasting my time on this place. Uh, so I'm going to go back home and see if I can find something else to go. Maybe I'll just go back to the mountain. Right. So I get back home. My wife's like, what are you doing here? And so I explained to her the whole fire ant situation. And she laughed. And she's like, well, why don't you just go to Abbeville? Uh, so my parents have been in this – her family – has been in this place in this town for like 300 years, and uh, and so they own a lot of land in this area. Um, I think right now they own like 100 acres or so collectively. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's not a bad idea, right? It's about half distance from the woods where I usually go, and uh, like I know the area pretty well, so maybe. So I go out there, I I go to her uncle's house, and uh, he's like, you're doing what? <laughs> I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna go 
hang out in the woods and meditate for a couple of days. He's like, you're not in trouble with the law, are you? I said, no. <laughs> uh, I got to get he, away. <laughs> he, well, he's that, he's that, he's a very jokey guy. You guys would love him, actually. He's a, he's a regular comedian. Uh, but he, he gave me a good spot to go. And uh, I had a hard time finding it because he said it was a road, but it's not an actual road. It's really like a small break in some bushes. Like a trail path uh, or something. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so the that side of the of the road is lined with trees and bushes, and and I know that there's a field there because just people in the area or sometimes family, um, there's a couple deer blinds set up there in front of this field, and so I know people go deer hunting and stuff there, and uh, and there's wild boar there, so people go hunting for wild boar too, and uh, he's like, yeah, this is, you go up the road, there's a little road on the left, just go in there and you'll get into the field, just go down to the end of the field. I, mean, I pass this thing like three times. Mm. Right. Because it's just like wide enough for a car to fit in. Right. Um, so I finally found it. I went in there and uh, I drove through the field and I found the spot. Uh, I don't know how big it is, maybe half a mile down, a mile down uh, line. It's all lined with trees around the field. And, and there's a, a ton of land. Like there's a couple hiking trails on the right. Um, there is a like a lumber company that owns like 500 acres beyond this piece of property. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a large place. Um, I set up like right outside of, of the field and, uh, there's a, there's a little trailer there that some family friend like had parked it there and she, she had recently died about a, a week or two before that. So I knew there was going to be nobody there. So there's going to um, be ghosts right by where you were. <laughs> there might've been ghosts. Be no, no ghosts. <laughs> yeah, no ghosts. But, but there was a little table with some chairs there. So I was like, let me ask you, know, you this. Were it's... you thinking about that in that terms of like, you're going to be by somewhere where somebody passed away? No, I'm I'm not worried about that. Uh, I, I'm not talking about like ghosts necessarily, but just like the <laughs> the weirdness behind. Oh, behind I just feel like that, like being in a place where somebody recently died. Yeah, yeah, there's something weird about that, right? I mean, I guess especially you're going to be meditating in that area. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really worried about that, man. All right. I was actually a little more concerned about the wild boar, like maybe destroying my tent while I'm sitting in it. You know what yeah, I mean? That's that'll yeah. get you. Um, I don't know if you guys have wild boar where you guys are at, but they're, uh, no. they're pretty vicious. Yeah. They're oh, yeah. pretty vicious. Um, I didn't see a single wild boar. Uh, I didn't see any deer either. I yeah, mean, I heard vicious stuff and walking delicious. in the woods. <laughs> the deer. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, the, my, the my, boar. Well, oh, the, the deer boar? too. I think you got to be careful with the deer now with the CWD or chronic wasting disease. I'm not saying that. Oh, yeah. it's just something that we should keep an eye on, uh, because we're big. I mean, but, Michigan, we've got probably one of the largest deer population there is. I grew up in the Northeast. So I've always been kind of weary of deer because of uh, ticks. Oh, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, I think the CWD is probably worse. But, anyway, yeah, this is where I set up my spot, man. And uh, and it was it, it was awesome. Like, the first day was terrible, horrible experience. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the Southeast, and, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning at 6, 7 o'clock, and it's 90 degrees outside already. Jeez. Um so I, I ended up getting to this place around noon, and uh, I mean it had to be at least a hundred. And the the spot where I set my tent up was right outside of the the border with the woods, so it was it was pretty well shaded, um, but it was still scalding hot. Mm. Uh, but I set up my tent there, and uh, yeah, I just you mentioned you were just out. sitting in your tent. How would you, how could you do that at a hundred? We go camping if you're like in the sun. Lodge. Yeah, you wake up. I want to murder my. I jump in the river, which is like 50 <laughs> degrees uh, instantly because it's it's way refreshing compared to <laughs> what's going on there. So that's actually a funny story because I had a terrible time sleeping that night. Because um, usually when I go when I go camping, I go in the fall. So you know it's in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I had a terrible time sleeping because I, for some reason I was like I'm gonna take my sleeping bag and I'm not gonna sleep in it but I'm going to sleep on it, not realizing that just the sleeping bag would absorb all my body heat. And so I couldn't sleep in my sleeping bag because I would wake up just dripping sweat, <laughs> right? And just in the part where I was laying on it. Um, so I ended up just like putting a sheet down and laid on that. But uh, no, the tent actually has windows all around it. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the, t- on the two sides, there's triangle windows. So you can bring them down. And then on these sides over here, there's just still like small death. winds. Yeah, it's still really hot. But uh, but listen, I I was just trying to to be, you know what I mean? Like my right. thing was like, what's it like? Just but did you only drink, bring like one jug of water? You said on yeah. So 
so I brought no food with me. Uh, I brought one one gallon of water because uh, I figured like I'm only going to be there a couple days, right? I, I wanted to go a full week, and I knew I'd be fine not eating for a whole week, but that's why I brought the water just in case. And uh, there is a stream like a couple hundred yards down from where I was at, so it's not like I would die of thirst, right? Uh, or I could go to my my wife's uncle's house, you know, a mile or two down the road. Um, but but the point was to not have to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah, that river right? might have been diarrhea and, poison time, though. Well, it could have been. It could have been. And the thing is, it's not like I didn't research beforehand. You know what I mean? Uh, like, I know that you, if you don't drink water for three days, you die. I mean, flowing water, if it's clear, you could probably get away with it. Um, if it's a stagnant pool, you, you, you might as well just be on that show. What's that on history? Like, alo- alone? <laughs> alone? Or, yeah, like yeah, naked yeah. and afraid, I, like one of those. My in-laws love. They actually made my in-laws made a joke about it when they heard a, about this thing uh, a couple of days after I came back, because they love watching Alone. And he's like, my my father was like, is it is it like Alone? <laughs> like it's made nothing a video, like Alone. Man, that. <laughs> yeah, I got a whole series. You want to buy it? But but no, but I wanted to to as much as I could in a short period of time replicate like an old school mystical experience, right? Sure. Like I wasn't planning on doing this forty days in a cave. Um, but, you know, when, like, Native Americans go on Vision Quest, they're just kind of, like, thrown out in the woods and, like, ah, we'll see you in a couple of days. Right. And and that was it, right? And this is kind of the experience I wanted to replicate. So that's why I had no food and, and very little water because my family does depend on me, so I need to come back at some point, you know right. what I mean? Um, but but I wanted to replicate that experience as much as possible. And, and I did do my research. So if I had to go to the stream, I did have purification tabs and all that stuff. Okay. Um, it's not like I just went completely blind in here. But uh, but I had no expectations. And, and I think that's when I realized that I shouldn't expect anything is when things became more interesting. Right. Uh, so the first day you kind of deal with the heat and just being in a place you're not familiar with. And and that's a little difficult. But after a while, you just kind of get used to it, you know, and I think that's when when you just learn to take in the experience is when uh, when you start opening up a little bit. And uh, and that's when things got a little more fun. Uh, into the second day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now you've did this. Um, what you said for three days? Three days. Uh, is there ever a plan to maybe do that again and maybe implement some sort of psychoactive yeah. compounds? So on this first experience, I purposely chose not to bring any psychedelics with me because uh, I wanted to kind of have a control of what just the pure experience was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that was my intent. Um, I also didn't want to be jaded by anything else. Right. I want. I want. If I if I found anything out of this experience, I wanted it to be purely based on the experience. Um, the next time, maybe. Uh, but going back to the synchronicity, a couple of days ago, my wife listened to this podcast. Uh, something about black like prisoners. I don't know. And somehow they started to talk about meditation. And this one guy had done this like ten day solo retreat in the woods after he got out of prison mm-hmm. uh, which i thought was kind of odd if you're in prison to come out and want to do the solo retreat but it also made sense uh, i'm sure it cleared him up quite a bit um and so she started telling me this experience and i was like would you want to do that and i was like yeah i mean i want to do like a 40 day in the wood retreat right um so so yes at some point i i do want to go longer um the thing is i just want to make sure i plan this correctly um, so right now, um, I, I left a job that I was very unhappy with. So um, right now I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of living the dream, you know, I'm I mean, just, that, uh, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Now's the time yes. to do it. Uh, I'm just kind of hanging out, you know, working on the yard and, and working on myself. And, uh, you know, at some point I'll have to go back to work. And so obviously it'll be before that, but, but I do want to do, uh, you know, at least the 10 days, I would love to do a full month. Um, of just out in the woods. And, and I think the spot might be good enough to do that um, because it is far away enough from things where I don't have to worry about anything. And if uh, you know something happened with my family or my kids or anything, somebody could easily find me there. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I do plan on doing that. Um, I mean, I'd love to do it in a cave. <laughs> I don't have caves near me, you know what I mean? I can go out to this, the spot on the mountains that I have, uh, and there are caves near there. But, uh, you know, one step at a time, right? Yeah. One step at a time. 
Yeah, I mean the it's, uh, the cave thing obviously is is an interesting thing, and if you could do it, um, I think that's something that could be maybe filmed or put a camera up while it's happening and just kind of yeah. But if it's dark uh, in there, you ain't gonna yeah. Well, that well that well, was it, that's what infrared I, cam. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say is infrared, but then at the same yeah. time, oh, it still true. wouldn't you wouldn't be able to know what's going on inside your head, obviously. So um, that's true. But it would be interesting to see if things started to visually have, like let's say you were in there for two weeks and you did start to have some sort of crazy endogenous psychedelic experience. Um, what would it look like from the outside? Would it be similar to um, an exogenous, you know, ex- experience? I don't know. You know, I've, I've tried to get my wife to take notes, like while I go through one of my rituals here at home, um, but she doesn't want to do it. So, <laughs> Uh, I might need to just set up a camera and do it that way. She's yeah. like, I don't yeah, want to be in there when you're doing that. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think it'd be interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever gone to like a float tank or anything like that. Uh, no, I want to though. So I, I, I did a, I did, you did a, you did a float tank? How no, long? no, no, I, I haven't. I, but I would, would I, oh, you haven't. I, growing up, we grew up on the water. So we would go to like either the pool or the lake or whatever. And I would always lay, I'm, you can float at the top obviously and just pass yeah. out kind of and let the sun while you're kind of, it's like a form of meditation, I think. So I used yeah. to do that. So it's, it's not the same from the dep- deprivation and the sensory stuff, but it's similar in terms of floating on top of the water and feeling that feeling. Well, and the thing would be, you know, the, the temperature also, cause the, the water in the river or the lake is not your body temperature, right? Right. right. That's one of the aspects of the throat tank and why you feel like you're just floating in space as opposed to just floating on water. Um, I've only done it once. I did it for 60 mm. minutes, and I would love to do it for longer. Um, but just thinking about that one-hour experience lasting for, you know, 30 days, uh, I mean, it'd be interesting. Intense. It would be very interesting. Uh, I think it, it requires preparation, right? So that's why I'm, I'm okay with – now, I wanted to go seven days, and I'm okay with only going three uh, one thing I, I didn't talk about is I, I flew out of there on day three. <laughs> um, Back to reality. No, it, it was so weird because all of a sudden, like the things that I, the thoughts that I've been having kind of started like clicking in my mind. And I was like, nope, I got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. I was like, if I, if I stay here, I don't know what's going to happen in my mind. <laughs> um, it was kind yeah. of like you start having these realizations and you're afraid. You'd be of, the like, next old lady to pass away in that same spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be the ghost in the woods. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I got back to reality uh, to kind of. There we go. Now we're talking movie ideas. Hey, listen. You, the ghost in the woods. Right now. Yeah. You, like to do a, you like to do some cooking. You know when you take spaghetti and you put it in cold water to stop it from cooking? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of how I felt. If I had stayed there, I'd continue cooking, man. Yeah, that's I a got good, blanched. I a, that's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, But yeah, so the next time I'm going to do a little longer, maybe a, a week, and then maybe I'll try to, and then I'll do the month thing. Maybe at some point right, in a cave. Well, be Who careful. Knows? We need your mind. I think you set a precedent for Maurice. Now we're going to have to send Maurice out there. To... <laughs> I am going in the woods next weekend, so we'll see what happens. Hey, see, when you're filming the the Comet, man. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, when I was uh, for part two here, we'll give, we'll tickle some people with a little tidbit. I, I was just staring up at the sky, and there was some weird stuff going on, so I, I pulled the camera out again. It's super dark. Like, when your eyes get adjusted to the night sky, it's not the same when you flip on a video camera but there were some weird streaking dots and again i'm not making any claims but just yeah. being out out there by yourself you never know what's gonna and happen it wasn't a shooting star it wasn't right. a shooting star so i don't even know if i talked about this on the podcast i think i did it on the episode uh but i did see some lights and and this goes back to the point of making sure you do your due diligence when you get into the stuff i could have easily because i mean i love i would love to see like a flying saucer running yeah 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 <laughs> And so immediately I was like, hell yeah, I just saw a UFO, right? <laughs> Got and then one. I, and then oh. I saw another one kind of go by a few minutes later, the other direction. And I was like, this is magical. Like, you know, I, I've seen something once in my life. And, and now I see like two back to back, right? Right. But then immediately you're like, you kind of got to make sense of this thing, right? Like mm-hmm. just because you want to believe doesn't mean that it's there. Uh, so when I got home, that one of the first things that I did was actually look up satellite trajectories, uh, and I found the two satellites that I saw that night. Or I, I believe that's, that's what it was. Yeah. Because well, the, tra- the trajectory seemed to match. Yeah. So, 
Uh, yeah, oh, you gotta always do the work, man. Right, just because you want to believe doesn't mean well, that it's there. Right? If it's a satellite too, you you time it so you'd be able to see it swing back around the same spot after. I don't know how long it is. Uh, I think the International Space Station once every I forget how many minutes it's traveling at like seventeen thousand miles an hour or something ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean you can pick them out. Um, pretty easily if you know what you're looking for. I've seen when we go to northern Michigan, you can see stars from horizon to horizon. So I mean, I when I look, you can see probably two or three satellites that are pretty visible to the naked eye. Um, I've never seen anything in the sky that was like weird, like other than that. But I'm holding out hope that maybe I do, and maybe it'll be a game changer. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I had an experience with uh, I talked to Sean about it when Sean was on my show. Did I? Yeah, pretty sure I did. Uh, where I saw these three lights just kind of appear and then move up uh, at the same time. And this this was an experience over like an hour, right? Like I, I went outside, I was at work, and I went outside and I saw this light, and I was like, eh, airplanes, because mm-hmm. uh, there's an airport nearby. And I was inside. I came back out later. And I looked, and I was like, oh, that thing's still there. That's weird. Um, went inside, came back out later and there it is again. And then all of a sudden, like two other ones appear. Um, actually, you know what? I just, I just commented on, uh, on Mike's experience on Indra's web. So, uh, you can look at my comment. I put, posted that on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's the only one that I couldn't explain. Right. Cause to me at first it was airplanes and then I was like, yeah, maybe Venus until now it's three lights. Right. So now it's, it can't be Venus. Right. Uh, but I, I mean, it's technically UFO, right? It's an unidentified flying object. That's true. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I never insinuate that it, I, I saw an alien spaceship. Yeah. Uh, and it was the same thing with these satellites, right? Like, they were moving pretty slow, and they were in opposite directions. Right. But uh, it was such a large and bright light, I don't know. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't bring a watch with me. I don't have my phone with me. So my sense of time is all wrong. So I could have just guessed on a time when I saw these things. Yeah. It's kind of, you're kind of, you know, a little bit out there and I'm more useful. You're close to Detroit. You're still a little ways out there. You know, you could go not that far and be kind of out there for me. It's like, I don't live that far from O'Hare. And while there's been yeah. one of the more famous UFO sightings at O'Hare and supposedly there's a lot of activity in the Chicago land area. Um, it's hard because through my skylights, I always see the planes and stuff like that. So it's like, do I want to sit there and by chance, one of them won't be a plane. You know, I don't know. But um, when you don't go Mothman watching. Yeah. Well, there's, well, <laughs> it's funny you say that there's actually been like a huge uptick in the last few years of like yeah. Mothman in Chicago. I don't know what the story is with that, but um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of weird stuff about Chicago that, that are paranormal like and UFO like. And um, I've had weird things happen out here that I can't really explain. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the, the, from like a sighting perspective, I would like to see something. I'm not going to lie, but, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to make something up either. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. For you sure. got to keep the credibility. Yep. Yep. And you always got to do your due diligence, man. That's an important thing, right? Just cause you see weird stuff doesn't mean it's something weird. Right. You just might not have an explanation for it. Right. And if you, if you decide that none of those solutions are correct, then maybe you did see something that's unexplainable, right? Maybe you saw Mothman or UFO <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah. the Mothman thing, I started rereading Mothman not that long ago. I, I, I paused it for like a week or so, but I got to get back in it. But I, just the way that John Keel writes about it, it's, it's pretty interesting. And all the stuff that was going on at the time between like MK Ultra and, um, you know, uh, the paranormal stuff that some people believed and not others and just oh, the way yeah. everything's framed and everything. Um, I've tried to look at that and like think, well, what could these be? And is it something in ourselves too? When we get scared, like it's that old feeling when you're running up the stairs from the basement and it's dark and there's, you think there's something behind you or you have a, you feel a presence or whatever, you know, I think everybody as a kid kind of has that experience uh, where your mom's like, come up for dinner, and you turn off the lights down there, and you, you're you like, oh, shit, there's something behind me. i got to run up this. So, like, I yep. think about things in that term. Like, is it something that we're doing to ourselves through fear or yeah. maybe some epigenetic past memory of something crazy that actually was real? 
or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I lo- keeping yourself alive. Yeah, I, I look at things from that perspective and try and debunk it through that way too because it could just be our own minds playing tricks on us. Yeah, I think sometimes things show up really weirdly too. Um, so when I, after I had this really crazy psychedelic experience and, and things just started synchronizing, um, I, it's, I started feeling your presence out here. So the room that I'm in is attached to the garage. But I never thought anything about it, right? Um, I was like, yeah, whatever. But it's weird how things collide. Because, like, one day, our our oldest daughter, she's like, she started talking about hearing, like, somebody walking in the master bedroom at night. And and so now, like, my wife and daughter think there's a ghost in the house. And so when when they brought it up the first time, I was like, oh, yeah, that's Casper. He's he's in the garage. Like, as a joke, right? right? Um, Because... I, I would feel this thing and I, I still don't know if it's a ghost or not. Right. Uh, but it's kind of become a family joke when like a noise pops up at night. It's like Casper's getting out of the garage and walking around the house. Uh, is there something to that? I mean, I don't know. I've never seen anything. Right. It's one of those things where like you feel like you can tell somebody's walking behind you and things like that. Um, so I'm not saying it's a ghost, um, but it's also it's interesting synchronicities, right? Between yeah. having these weird meditative psychedelic states and then all of a sudden like things showing up, right? Like the ghost or the lights or whatever else. Right. So, I don't know. Well, isn't it though, like you could go to like Rupert Sheldrick's like morphic res- resonance and that certain material, whether it be a house or a location or even na- parts of nature where there's this like history built into the fabric of that specific place or, you know, that place Mm -hmm. in time kind of a thing. Like it's capturing, you know, and you could even, um, there's a great documentary where, um, what's the, uh, Muscle Shoals, which is a recording studio in Alabama where they recorded all these famous albums, um, even referenced in the Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner. Um, I believe is, is that Sweet Home Alabama where they talk about Muscle Shoals? Yeah, I think it is. Um, when you have something like that, it's, it almost feels like there's greatness built into the foundation of something and mm-hmm. that you have the echo of all these past amazing musicians and there's a feeling when you walk in there and it's just kind of programmed that way. Right. Um, now, is that is that is there something real there? Is that us building it up within ourselves to create this um, this thing? Or is is there something to it where maybe there is bits of information encoded into space and time in certain locations. And um, if you look close enough or tap into it, you know, it could be beneficial in some way. Well, and you know, this is when you need to be very careful because uh, this is when people start praying on other people. Uh, you know, it could be, I mean, it could be just that it could be something actually special in the structure of this particular place of space time, or it could be, you know, like, these great people worked in this place. And so they just kind of like leave part of their energy behind mm-hmm. or, you know, you can get into something like, uh, like egregores where you, you create this like place of mental energy kind of, um, I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, what's that movie? Like the shining, right? Yeah. The, the hotel, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, well, haven't you been there lot Maurice, of... the one in Colorado? Yeah. The one that, they actually, that, uh, Stephen King like based it on. It's pretty, yeah pretty eerie we i was with my band we kind of like snuck into one of the tours and it was pretty cool that's awesome yeah my my wife is a huge stephen king fan we've never been but uh we just watched uh dr sleep so that's why i I thought oh i gotta see that that's very good good thing is it good it's very good it was mentioned to me and i turned it down based on the fact (laughs) that it couldn't be anywhere near as good as the first one i i'm not i heard it was good bro Okay. Uh, I'm not a Stephen King fan. I do like The Shining though, but I think it's because it's more Kubrick. Isn't than... it you and McGregor yeah, yeah. though? But I do like him. If that is. Yes. Yeah, he's in it. Yeah, he's in it. Uh, Big Fish. That's a that's an name. underrated movie. That's a great film. Are you kidding me? People don't talk about that? Big Fish. Was that McGregor? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen that in a long time. It's almost that's like a. Great a movie. That's a, it's a dad and the kid, right? Yeah, yeah but it's almost yeah, like yeah. Alice in Wonderland, but with like a grown guy going through. There's a good moral to the story. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 worth a watch if nobody's seen it. Uh, anyway, so I mean, those places could be like that, right? Or same with with ghosts. Maybe they're just energy manifestations, right? Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, when you start saying stuff like that, people are like, "Whoa, that's it's kind of oh, weird." Talking about on. energy. Well, when you're talking about a realistic right? way, like we are 
as opposed to yeah. like we've got the gear. We're in the the haunted uh, <laughs> cemetery. I'm about know? to hit the. Uh, We're in the psych the, ward uh, here Harrison's with our Island. with our infrared. And look, I'm not disparaging anybody that really does go looking for ghosts or anything like that. That's not what I'm doing. But what I am saying is, I think there is a realistic way to approach these subjects where there might be something scientific, like you said, just some trapped energy, sure. you know, of some nature or information you know some there's theories being thrown around now that that's what dark matter is is the information that's being because it's got to go somewhere mm -hmm. right if you come up with information it's got to be stored well, so it's like the cloud almost like a cloud analogy where yeah you're putting it in the cloud but where's the cloud it's got to go somewhere right right it's got to go somewhere yeah that's uh that's like there's talk about that with uh with black holes where like tech that there's could be some theoretical device that you could have uh, that would be able to read the information out of a black hole, um, in which case you'd be able to like recreate anything that went into it, uh, because all the information is never destroyed; it just stays in the in the black hole. Right, right. the information is always there. The singularity. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you always say uh, that the world is magic. I mean, I think that's the most the truest thing ever, man. Uh, yeah, we convince it ourselves it's not though, and I do it too. I mean, I try and run with. If I wake up and I can convince myself that day that it's magic i'm gonna have a good day if it's if i convince myself otherwise it might be a tough one well the thing is when when you say something like that people assume like you're gonna start putting rabbits out of a hat right <laughs> um because they don't have an understanding of what magic is but but i mean the world is magic man and like i said i i don't know how real any of my mystical experiences or psychedelic trips have been um, but they certainly feel more real than than us talking right now, right? They're real. And, and they so, they are. I mean, it's they're absolutely. What real. What is that? Terrence and uh, Dennis McKenna always say: if you, if it's real and you have the experience, it's real. Now, does it have some sort of, um, you know, relevant thing that can be used in this realm or society or shared with other mm -hmm. people? That's a different story. But the fact that you experienced it, it is an actual real thing that happened. Well, and I exactly. think it's on the next episode where I talk a little bit about this um, after I talk about my trip. It's like, you know, you everyone wants things to be real. Like just because you touch them doesn't mean that they're not real. Right. Like the words coming out of my mouth are real. Right. They, they're mm -hmm. they're objects. Mm -hmm. Right. They have qualities that you can grasp and understand. You just can't hold them with your hand or, you know, ideas like democracy or whatever. Um, just because they're not physical objects doesn't make them, number one, not an object and two, not real. Um, so yeah, for sure. I think all these experiences are real. Um, it's just a matter of how would you prove that reality to somebody else? Right. And, and you can't, uh, cause that, that's kind of a, the, the hard problem of consciousness, right? You can go back all the way back and you can't prove that there's a consciousness in you or around you. And just like, I can't prove that I exist to you and you exist to me. Um, yeah, I'm on a, but lately on a non-objective reality run here where I don't think mm. that I think what we're doing is ultimately creating a reality together which we all participate and agree on but I don't think that that exists outside of us because you can't have it both ways you can't say there's an objective reality and we're the only ones because if that's the case if we didn't exist that objective reality would not exist right yeah I used to say uh, that I was a polysolipsist because uh, I used to love the polycism idea, uh, the solipsism idea, but but it didn't make sense to just be just me and nothing else. Because what about everybody else talking? So I ended up going with the polysolipsist, where like everybody exists, but nobody lives in the same reality. Wow. Just the when we when we meet, or it's like our realities are colliding in this one particular place, mm -hmm. uh, but everything outside of that exists purely. On, in my reality or maybe right? you both found like something that. that you connect to in the universe that is not something that's normal yeah yeah i'm gonna have to noodle on that one <laughs> yes yeah, so, he pulls out a guitar starts man. shredding <laughs> hey, <I> hey. Got <laughs> you got the, the the new bill and ted's coming out you can be like uh the new bill and ted man dude those are classic i know people brother People might <laughs> people might dump on them at the, the I like the second one better with uh, when they go down to I think it's hell they go down to hell and they've got yeah. Oh, yeah. that one's uh, George Carlin's yeah. there. <laughs> or no wait is that yeah, yeah, yeah he's in that yeah those are classics <laughs> that's awesome um I have a buddy of mine every time we talk time travel he always brings up Bill and Ted and I'm like dude you can't base your ideas on on time travel on Bill and Ted yeah the best time travel ever done in cinema so great <laughs> have you ever seen Primer. 
Is that the one in the box? Yeah, where they, they set the up box? in the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a super low budget. That's dude, that's one of my favorite movies. Like I made that for like two grand or something. That's phenomenal, I think. Nice. There's a there's a lot of good ones like that. Um, man, I will have to look them up. I, I keep a list of these things. I, I don't have it. All. I love time travel movies. Yeah, because yeah. it can go either way. Some of them have really good concepts, and some of them are just junk. There's there's one that's similar to Primer, but he finds like a hole in a baseboard of a room. Mm-hmm. And he has to he he wants to save I think his girlfriend or somebody, and he ends up getting into this whole big thing, um, and ends up being the cause of the problem was like time uh, traveler's he, he, wife or something no no no. this is like a really indie film oh okay um and another good one is uh time crimes is the spanish film uh so it'll I be subtitled. Heard that one either dude have you time guys crimes seen the one there's this guy he's got like crazy hair and there's this like silver car and then you've got this it's called ba- yeah yeah yeah, this guy, yeah. <laughs> back to the future uh no look up time crimes i think it's on netflix there's, this, uh, there's a guy named out. Biff. Have you seen this movie? <laughs> <laughs> this is the most accurate time travel film Biff. around. Biff. Yeah, it is. He, he's there's three of president them. now, right? Yeah. Oh, wait. We yeah, don't talk yeah. politics. My bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very relevant. Um, <laughs> it is. But, the yeah, I remember that's the, the old uh, sports book where they open up. It's like the Cubs won the World Series. That was the big joke because, like, when the Cubs were – starting to play better before they won the world series they're like this is the year it set it in you know back to the future and then they ended up losing in the playoffs which they ended up winning the next year (laughs) but still it's funny yeah Uh, i love that so looking on your your journeys and your travels though i mean where do you see this going because i think that for for me um not to base it off of my thing or anything but I see this as I need to get away from the material stuff now in terms of I think there's only so far you could always learn stuff about the the universe or the the material realm. You could always there's always new stuff being discovered, new details of things that have already been discovered. It just goes on and on forever. That's just what it's going to do. But I I think if you're going to find some sort of ultimate truth for yourself, or some sort of purpose you have to look inwards and I think that I was while I initially did that and then I stepped away because I wanted to know the underpinnings of how the material stuff works now I kind of get that from I'm not again I'm not saying I know everything but just that I think I need to get back to the the self or the the inner workings of it because I think that you can't you can't get to where people want to if you're looking for like some sort of enlightenment or spiritual conquest. You can't get to it through the external world. So for me, it's going to be kind of shifting gears and getting away from the physical stuff and getting back to the immaterial aspect of self. So one thing that I've I've really been diving into lately is uh, learning not to get rid of certain aspects of yourself. I talked a little bit about this when I was doing the shadow work episodes. Um, But I think, I think we focus too much on one thing, like this will be what works. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I mean, we're going really long, so I don't even know if I want to go into Gurdjieff, but you know, Gurdjieff had this idea of, I mean, Buddha had the same way, right? That's why he came up with the middle path. Um, Where like people feel like this is the way to enlightenment. And then someone's like, well, that's the wrong way. Let's do it this way. And neither one of those things work, so let's create a middle path. And then Gurdjieff had, you know, the three ways don't work. Let me create the fourth way Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of integrates all these things, right? You find some kind of balance in between the three. And, you know, people always wanted to be more enlightened. They want to be better. They want to be more moral people. They want to be better people, good people, like all this stuff. And I think that's... I think that's really a bad approach. And maybe that's why we keep going to this process of never really finding an answer. I think I think the real approach is not to ignore either one of those things, but to find a way to integrate them. Right. So don't just be a good person, right? Like if you if you're angry with somebody, like it's fine to be angry, right? Don't feel like you should be ashamed to be angry. Um but we're like kind of conditioned to ignore certain aspects of ourselves Mm -hmm. and, and we can only be whole people if we accept all of, all of what we are not just the good parts of it. Um, and I think that goes true with, with the material versus spiritual thing. 
I don't think you need to necessarily ignore material aspects of, of self-realization because like you're a material being. So in order for you to any of these do any of these things, you have to find a way to integrate those into your spirituality. And and I really realized this after doing this meditation retreat, man, because like the things that I realized as a result were not like necessarily new ideas, but it, it was like I fi- I got them, mm-hmm. right? Like I understand now. Um, it's not. It's one of those things where like, oh yeah, I read like 50 books and like, this is how Hinduism works. Let me tell you how meditation works. Um, it's like, you know, the, the metaphor I like to use always is is walking the path versus knowing the path. Right. And and that's the realization that I had. And that's purely a physical exercise that I did, right? Like yes, there was meditation, but the purpose was just to sit and do nothing, right? Mm-hmm. To just be a lump of flesh. Um, and that's really like the most materialistic exercise you can do is learn to be a lump of flesh. Um, and so I think you can definitely integrate the two. It's just how much work you want to put in it, right? Um, I'm not saying that 12 hours of meditation will do it, but for some people it might. I'm not saying to do five grams of mushrooms. For some people that might work. Um, the old heroic dose. Yeah, the old heroic dose. Um, I just think there ha- you need to experiment and be okay with failing. If, if certain things don't work for you, that's fine, right? Not everything works for everybody, right? Just like everybody has different genetics and, and some medication may have different effects on people, I think the same works mentally. Just, just the, the structure of your mind works in a certain way and you're going to process the information different. And that might be true of whatever you consider spirit, right? Consciousness or a soul or whatever. Um there might be some aspects of that as well. And so the only way to find some kind of answer that it makes sense in your reality, I think, is to try everything and focus on what what, what you feel gives you the best results. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I, I, I would just point out, though, for me, though, the when, when I say, like, this physical reality or whatever, like, you could, again, be doing science till the end of, uh, we exist or the end of time or whatever the case may be, how much further or how much closer would that have gotten you to the truth? And h- let me put it like this. If the, let's just say hypothetically, the multiverse hypothesis is real and Ooh. it ends up being that there's m- millions and billions and infinite um, variations of this universe where same things are happening, different things, you know, uh, almost completely similar, but a little different or whatever the case may be we would be no closer at the end of this universe than we would be. So I guess my point was there's right. there's no end to that where you could just keep doing that forever. And maybe that's good for technology and the advancement of, you know, the human, um, uh, you know, humans in terms of making things better for people to live in this physical realm. But what I'm talking about is, I've started this thing to find some sort of universal truths and I don't think the universal truths are contained in material science. I'm not saying that there's no truth there. I'm saying it's not going to give you that transcendent feeling that we all look for or that transcendent uh, belief or thing that happens that changes your life. I don't think that that exists in the physical Mm. realm of that is what I'm saying. I think again, I had to be very specific about this in that episode because I, I said some really crazy stuff. Um, and so I'm going to say the same thing again. I don't feel like, I achieve, uh, like I'm an enlightened being in any respect whatsoever. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think the, this, this imaginary idea of enlightenment is what enlightenment is at all. Um, yeah, I agree, I agree with that. But, but I think you can definitely or should definitely have enlightening experiences throughout your life. And, and whether you have one or a million doesn't mean you're any more enlightened, right? Um, Cause some experiences might be more impactful than others. Um, but I do feel like I had an enlightenment experience at, at this retreat. Uh, just like I feel like my psychedelic work has given me many enlightenment experiences. Um, I've had a couple of those as well. I, what I would say to that is, is th- those are the moments where the veil has been lifted and you get to peer for just a second 
into the way things work or the way that you have interpreted they work up until this point? Well, and the thing is, the the issue is not the experience. The issue is what happens after, right? Like you and I have talked about this ego backlash stuff a lot in private mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times when you have experiences, it's very easy to like recreate this shell, this ego shell mm -hmm. faster than before and thicker than before. Um, and so the next experience you have might require a lot more work to break the shell again and peer through the veil. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you can have that. You can have those constantly. Uh, and I think there, there, there is at some point where you can, even if not completely remove the veil, almost like open it at will, mm -hmm. right? Where like, I think you're always going to have some kind of ego because you have a physical body and the, the, the core instinct of your physical being is survival, right? So you're not going to do things that are going to put yourself in harm's way. I mean, there are people that do that. Right. Um, but like under a normal functional organism, your purpose is to survive, to create another generation. Right. Yeah. So I, I have kids right now. So by, according to nature, there's no purpose for me anymore. Right. Right. I fulfilled my purpose. Um, but I, I want to find what my purpose is. Right. Cause it can't just be this physical thing, having more physical things. Um, the, the world is not a physical thing. Right. And, you know, new, new age folks, get the, the the physics thing real woo woo real quick and I, I, I don't like that but I understand why it happens mm -hmm. because you know the the core aspects of nature according to science are completely woo woo right I mean it's just empty space yeah I guess the the moments that I've had and I'll use this analogy because I think it fits it pretty well would be like at the end of the Wizard of Oz when they peel back the curtain and there's the guy projecting all the stuff over everything and you this whole time you thought it was this like <laughs> god this god like you know and it's really a dude speaking through a megaphone with all these bells and whistles and all this so i i, I feel like when i have those moments it's like that where i get a glimpse of like oh there's that but that still doesn't answer everything so there's still more to the story that keeps you kind of going back and while again i look upon society now almost like an alien like what are what's going on here what are we doing i don't i you know it, it's one of those things where um, there's a reason why I think that this mystery of life and these mysteries, whether it be, you know, what happens after we die, is there other life out there or whatever the case may be. I think this is what drives humanity. Cause I think that without mm. some sort of ultimate purpose, I think there's no reason to keep projecting. Like you mentioned though, from like a biological evolutionary standpoint that your purpose is over because you've you've had your kids or whatever but i would argue that you now then need to raise them to the point where they're self-sufficient to become the next better version martin 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever the, you know what i'm saying <laughs> like it's your job to car sure. carry that yeah. out so i i don't think it ends with the i mean i guess if you went to the strict nature i, I guess i see what you're saying but i do think that just because you've outlived one purpose doesn't mean that you don't have another purpose to fulfill after that. I, I hope that's to be true. Maybe I, I haven't decided that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way that I've slowly come to see things is that part of the problem is the thinking that we have to have a purpose um, where I, I think there there has to be at some point, and, and this might be what some consider enlightenment, but there has to be some point in, in your life where you realize that you're just enough, right? Just being yourself and accepting whatever it is that you are is, is all there is, right? And so at that point, you don't need to have a purpose to keep going because you're, you're perfectly content in yourself. What you're saying makes sense, but I would argue that most people don't have that perspective. For sure. So to get society to that level, um, and I'll I'll say it a million times, and I'll say it again. The, you know, Pl Plato wrote Socrates is basically pointing out that when you had the Ioni, uh, the you know Ionian physicists and the natural physics of the day, was that was the first thing or the first essence of like what we would consider science where they're trying to give mm -hmm. reasonable, logical, natural explanations for things that used to have, Oh, this God did this or this God did that or whatever. 
Now, when you do that, when you convert to these these things that, oh, this is the mechanism behind that, and there is no actual God controlling it, it's just the mechanism, I think that becomes dangerous in, in, in the way that I think S- Socrates pointed it out was that when you just have that, people start to get very weird about things. And I actually see think you see it reflected mm-hmm. in society with everything that's going on right now where there's a lot of chaos out there. And I think that it, there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. But when you look at the world we live in where there's no real religion and religions almost looked down upon now and when you say personal spirituality, even though you might be serious and sincere about it, people connect it to new age stuff that has, like you said, a lot of woo woo components to it that have no bearing. Um, But we need to get back to some sort of um, moral order. And I think that that's what, when they talk about that, that's what Socrates is scared of when you bring into these, uh, when you bring in these elements of what you're talking about, which is that, You have to be fine with just yourself. And that might be true. But again, I don't think that society looks at it like that. I think that you have to kind of, it's almost like a game in a way where it's better Mm. if some people believe this temporarily to ultimately get them to think along the lines of what you're saying, if that makes sense. Yeah, but see, that the the problem with that, and and that is, I think, 100% true in, in the world that we live in. So I'm not denying anything you said. But I think, for one, I do think that there is a place where we can get to where more and more people can get to this kind of mental state. Um, And, you know, it's not going to be a thing where, like, there's a revolution and all of a sudden, like, you know, down with the the bourgeois or whatever, right? This will take a very long time. It's it's already taken hundreds of thousands of years to get to the place where we are. Um, So I think that's number one. Number two, I think focusing too much on well, how do we fix this with society is part of the problem because you can't fix any of that. All you can fix is yourself, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and you, can, you can show somebody or tell somebody how to possibly fix themselves. Uh, you get into other problems then, of course, because you know usually people like power, and so you start getting institutionalized religions and you end up getting control of other people, and not just religion, but government too, right? Um, you know, in, in an ideal place, like, why should I have to have a government, right? That's one of the things is I don't need a government to tell me, like, if I can smoke weed or not, or if I can go, you know, sit naked in my front yard, right? right? Like, I should be able to do any of those things. Um, but at what point do those things overlap, right? Like, if there was no government, you wouldn't have roads, right? So you couldn't go on that nice trip to the mountains because there'd be no highway, right? You'd have to trek through dense forests. Yeah, um, people so, died before those things, you know, say so before there was roads, people had trails and paths and we know what happens on the Oregon Trail and the Appalachian exactly. Trail, you know, so uh I, but I guess I agree with what you're saying, but I just I'm not saying that we should do what I'm saying. I'm just saying I see even back then Socrates, whether mm-hmm. it was Plato that was actually saying that or if it was Socrates I think that it's important to to point out that purpose, whether it's your personal purpose or some ultimate purpose or whatever, just having a purpose helps you move the goalposts. And if we lived in a world where nobody had purpose and we just sat all sat around and meditated, who knows? Maybe maybe we this this planet would become a spaceship. I don't know, but I don't think that that's ever going to be the case. So that's why I'm presenting what I'm saying now, which is that I think that there needs to be something that produces some sort of moral order. And I, again, it doesn't have to be religion. It can be personal mm-hmm. spirituality. It could be just a belief in some higher purpose, whether it's helping other people or whatever the case may be. I think when you look at the people with that's quote unquote, the new atheists and the Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermers and all these, you know, skeptic, Interesting folks. Yeah, skeptic type people, uh, they seem miserable the way they talk about things, the way they present them. So yeah, it's just, it's very like droning and very like, why are you even alive if you don't even want to live? Cause that's the way it feels when they talk. So I'm, I'm merely presenting the point that the purpose that you might have now might be changed. It might be wrong. It might be false, but having something to push forward to ultimately gets you to the next level. And I think that we're stuck at some sort of plateau right now where we need some, next level if that makes sense 
So I think there is a place for skeptics. So even though I call them interesting people, it doesn't make them any less legitimate uh, or their ideas any less legitimate. Because, you know, we talked about this before. If you didn't have that person that went counter to what others are saying, there would be no progress. Right. And that's true for skeptics as well. Right. Just because they only believe in purely materialistic scientific fact doesn't mean that there's no. Yeah, for. that's never been my problem with it. My problem's always been them calling themselves objective when they're making oh, money off. Not that. Clearly not. Then they're going they're going in there as the skeptic. So that's my argument with the whole thing. It's like, don't proclaim yourself as truth or ultimately right when you're going in with a biased opinion already. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I will still kind of disagree with your point. I think there, I think you can get to a place where you don't need purpose to continue, uh, and, and that you still can continue without always needing the motivation to do something else. Um, I think there is a, a way to get there. Um, I, I'm, I don't think I'm there, but I think I, I can, I can well, see something down the line. You know what I mean? What's the mechanism though? Because wow. Meaning that are you just in the data? So like back to your dog, are you talking about going back to a dog like state where mm. there is, it's almost like ignorance is bliss and not knowing things and just living through no. mecha mechanism. Is that what you're talking about? Cause I, I'm a little no, confused. I that, I'm, uh, is I there think the complete opposite? I think okay. you can get to a point where it's not like, it's not like omniscience. Right. Uh, but I think you can get to a point where you can have this human mind with ideas and, and able to see into the future and look into the past and all this stuff, but at the same time, not have a need to worry about any of these things. And, and it, this is not like a, a thing where you're just like you become a lazy person. You just like sit in the woods and meditate all day or anything like that. I mean, you're going to need to eat, right? So you're going to go find food and this and the other, but that you would be perfectly content with just doing the thing that you're focusing on at the moment. Right. Whether that's taking a shower or finding food or meditating or going to the bathroom, like you're perfectly happy just with that state at that particular time. Um, yeah, I hear that. It, I, I, kind I, of the, I, I kind of see what you're saying. I just I want to kind of understand it. I might have to just think about this more after we're done here, because I, I even think when I look at evolution, I almost look at evolution itself has an ingrained purpose into it. So if you're always evolving, there is always going to be a purpose. You, you might not know the purpose even if you say mindfully that there's no purpose your body knows that there actually is a purpose does that make sense so so yes so you would have some kind of evolutionary impetus to re, re, to procreate right and so there's things that happen as a result or just of that. You survive have to eat, you have to, that's purpose you have to survive in order to procreate okay that's that's the purpose i mean that's the the, the final purpose um what I'm saying is this is kind of like the thing of, you know, the live in the now thing that everyone mm -hmm. talks about. Mm -hmm. yeah, I yeah. think if you really can achieve that state where all you focus on is what you're doing at that particular moment, you can get to a state where you don't need purpose because there is no purpose because there's nothing to look forward to or nothing to look back to. Right. right. All you're doing <clears throat> is focusing on that one thing. Yeah. And no, I, th I, I think, you. I think you can get there again. Uh, this is, some of it sounds a little woo woo and some of it comes from I'm not disagreeing. I'm not trying to just I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm actually trying to understand sure. where you're coming from on this. And I'm not saying that I, I, I do like the devil's advocate though. I, I do I do like what you're saying. I'm not saying I disagree with it. I'm just trying to arrive at what that would look like in somebody. Um maybe I'm trying to figure it out, you know, how it would look in, even in my, inside myself. And I, I even again you could say that's a whole different conversation because talking about purpose, you could talk about all day. What is actual purpose? And then we could get yeah. down to the physical purpose and then the mental purpose and psychological purpose, things like that. So I, th I, I think that maybe I just need to stew on this a little bit more because I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. I'm just trying to understand. Um, and I'm not saying it's right either. So don't get me wrong. No, I know. I'm just trying to understand what that would look like. Like I said, I think that that's when, I think about these things and I research things and I'm always visualizing. That's what I'm doing things in my head, you know, and even when I meditate, I'm running through processes. I'm like a visual type person. So I, you know, when I, sure. I imagine a lot of things, I, I think I have a pretty good imagination. So I'll just have to, uh, you know, meditate and look upon that and see, chew on that, see what comes so, out of it. 
so that's funny that you say that because so the example um, I was talking to a friend of mine about this thing because uh, he thought I was nuts and, and this is somebody that can't meditate for five minutes but but he likes the idea of it right so mm-hmm. he wants to try um, so if you if you decided you wanted to be a Buddhist monk let's say right so you go to a monastery and you meet with the head monk or whatever and he's like okay how do I achieve enlightenment and he'll be like okay go and meditate for six hours right mm-hmm. clear your mind for six hours and so the the trainee goes and he does this for a month and comes back and he's like listen i've I've meditated for 10 hours every day and i just can't clear my mind what what do i do how do i achieve enlightenment and so the guy the the head monk's like well maybe you're focusing too much on that maybe you should do it for eight hours right and so he goes and meditates for eight hours a day and he just can't do it he's like okay well now you know focus on it less do it for six hours and and you get to a point where like He's basically telling you that the exercise that you've been doing the whole time is completely irrelevant because you would get to a point where you're not focusing on anything for any period of time, right? Mm-hmm. Or you're not doing the meditation. Um, and and ultimately what that leads to is you you need to do the work to realize you don't need any work because you, you already have all of it inside of you, right? One of right. those things where like you're already God kind of deals, right? Um Except maybe a little different, because in that case, you would be everywhere, I guess, um, and know and know everything. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I need to think about this because I do see what you're saying. I still think, though, I personally believe that there's some ultimate purpose that we're just not able to see. Like we were talking about not having the tools to mm-hmm. understand. I think that that's the case with this too. I'm not again. I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, actually you could still be right while maybe there is a purpose but you don't need it kind of a thing you know what i'm saying like you could still live this amazing life and not need that purpose so i do think that those two things can live in the same universe uh together well and that's like your instincts right just because you're a physical animal doesn't mean you follow all your instincts all the time because if you did you'd probably be in jail right now right see what i mean so it's the same thing with purpose doesn't mean that there isn't one all I'm saying is that you can get to a point where you don't need to have one. Yeah, and it's it's a very Buddhist like and you yeah, know, Eckhart Tolle kind of a mm-hmm. you know way of looking at things where you don't let your mind use you and you live in the moment and all that there is is that present moment. So I, like I said, I get it. I love it. I love the idea of that. I just I don't know. My brain's geared towards some truth for whether it's for myself or maybe there is. I don't think that there is, but maybe there is some sort of ultimate truth. I don't, but I mean, I don't know if that's the way to find that, but that might be the whole point of what you're saying too. So it's kind of this well, weird thing that I, again, I, I would just have to think about a little bit more here and get back to you. I, I think the analytical mind is good. I think part of the, part of the reason why some of these things end up being woo woo and just dis- discredited is because the people that share these ideas don't really understand what they're talking about, mm-hmm. right? They're just repeating what somebody else said, right? Um, and like, am I making money? So they're like, oh yeah, people like this stuff. They eat it up. Let me just keep going, right? Um, but but they don't really understand it, right? Um, I don't I don't care about making money. Like I I took my website down because I was like I'm unhappy with it. I just don't care right now. I'll do it later. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, we talked a little bit about the social media earlier. Like I'm on Twitter because I I love Twitter and I've been on Twitter forever. Um, but like everything else, I don't really care. I had an Instagram. I barely do it. I, I tried Facebook. I was like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if one person listens or if a million people listen. The The point of me doing the whole thing stemmed out of this psychedelic experience that I had of me wanting to understand. And and I found that, you know, even though I was an English major and spent years and years of my life just writing papers every single day, I, at least analytically in my mind, it works better when I work through it talking out loud mm-hmm. um, and whether that's doing something like this with you guys or doing my own solo podcast i feel like i can grasp those things a little bit better when i do it that way so i mean i do my podcast for me and i've been fortunate enough to to meet new people like you guys that are awesome that i can go back and forth and decide like did this makes sense or not make sense right how can i how can this improve how can it not improve uh what can i get rid of um and it's just i mean that's that's the whole purpose of the whole thing is to gain some understanding and I, I hope that i will get to a point where 
I'm not saying I'll have an ultimate understanding where, where the understanding that I have will put me in a place where that's enough for me. And I just continue. Mm. No, I mean, yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense. And obviously you're on the right track. I mean, we started this podcast, same thing. It was, we did, we, I do this for me or I do this for us or things that we're interested. Maurice will say, Hey, you know, can we talk about this? Or I have my own ideas where I want things to go. If somebody, you know, um, sends me a message once in a while, I'll definitely consider guests and Mm -hmm. topic ideas and stuff like that. But, um, you know, we've gotten some crazy requests too, that there's no way that I would ever talk about, you know, so you have to, um, there is a certain uh, selfish element to this for sure. And I think that you should do it that way if that is the goal of what you're trying to do. And I think that by doing that, you aren't selling out because by nature, if you're always looking into things you're interested in, you're going to be interested and passionate about it and you Mm -hmm. won't be just doing it for the money. So I think that that's kind of where we're at, where we do want to make the podcast better. We want it to look better. We want it to sound better. We want it to be crisper. I want to know more things. I want to research things better at the end of the day. Um, if you're putting your message out there and you're happy with it, that's really all that matters. And, um, yeah, I think you're on the right path. And dude, not saying there's anything wrong with making money out of anything, right? So people make their professions out of this stuff, writing books when I, when, and yeah, research well, to do whatever. I think we're yeah. both mentioning the same thing, which would be this kind of taking advantage of people by proclaiming to have the answers, which we've never done. And I know you don't do that on your podcast either. It's this idea where I'll trade you secret info for a $10 <laughs> a month Patreon thing, or I'll give you, you know, this, this little, you know, uh, nugget of enlightenment or whatever the case may be for this amount of money. It's, it's those, those are the things we're talking about. We're not talking about having a Patreon page or people donating to your cause or whatever the case may be. We're specifically talking about the, snake oil salesman and uh that's 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 one of my favorite things about ufo twitter everyone's got a source somewhere you know (laughs) what i mean like i will say though there are there are legitimate people on ufo twitter where where they say something's gonna happen it does happen and it happens and those people you know who you are and kudos to you so yep yep but anyways but yeah so let's wrap it up here um it's been an eventful uh, two hours and 15 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> yes, it has. Hey, I don't mind. You're easy to talk to. You know, you have you know a lot about our show, so I think I have no problem going longer on episodes. It's usually, you know, you I'm sure you've done it too, where when you do a podcast, you kind of feel it dying down. It's not necessarily... I, I look at it organically yeah. where you know that this is the time or whatever. I never set like, oh, it's going to be an hour and a half or two hours or an hour or whatever the case may be, so... Uh, but yeah, and, and I, I try to go short too, cause I do it by myself and like, who wants to listen to one guy for an hour, two hours? You know what I mean? You'd be surprised. But, uh, I've listened to podcasts true. that have two and a half, three hours and people eat the shit up. So that's true. I, I, I try to be conscious of people's time though. So usually if I do like longer episodes, cause I do like two a week, usually, uh, the next week I'll do short ones. Mm-hmm. Um, something that doesn't work out, man. Like when I did my solo meditation retreat episode, I was like, ah, this will take like 30 minutes. <laughs> hour and 45 minutes later i was like okay i gotta wrap up yeah right <laughs> uh, so uh so yeah but I, I i love being on here i love you guys and uh thanks man hope thanks you guys keep coming doing on. the show well, we you love you too awesome. we appreciate you helping you know with our site and other things here and there and obviously we're getting you involved with the indra's web stuff and uh check out martin's podcast on itunes the uh, the alchemical mind and yeah, yeah. um are you you're on other platform? You're on, are you on Spotify and stuff too yet or no? Just... Yeah, it's Spotify, iTunes, any, anything that has a podcast in it, you can just search it and you'll find it on there. Okay. Uh, well, that yeah. sounds good. So check his stuff out. Give him a nice review and uh, five star rating. I know he'll appreciate that. Do that for <laughs> us as well. We need more of those too. Um, so check us out um, and subscribe to our channel. Mindescapepodcast.com is our website. Everything's on there. And patreon.com slash mindescape podcast for two dollars a month you will get exclusive content. And we have Laird Scranton is going to be on Thursday. So there'll also be a Patreon with him as well. We've done one with him recently in the past. That should be up on uh the Patreon there. So check that out. But we look forward to seeing you all again in the future. And thank you again, Martin, for coming on and we'll definitely have you on again. And Thanks, guys. Uh, We love everybody and peace and stay safe out there.